You'll be happy to know I'm not giving a talk this evening. I'm extremely thrilled to be here. I was booked for another convention in Kansas when they asked me to do this. And while I like to go to the entire convention whenever I can, uh, Skeptics of Oz in Kansas was willing, despite the fact that I'm doing a keynote at 4 o'clock tomorrow, to allow me to come up here and moderate this this evening and then fly out at the crack of dawn tomorrow. Because I really wanted to do this, I've been wanting to see this debate and versions of it for ages. I'm not a mythicist, which is partly why I'm here. I'm as close to the middle as you could possibly get, but we're not here to hear my thoughts. You can watch those on YouTube in a week or so. Instead, I'm going to describe the format and introduce our speakers this evening. I'm going to do my best to be the moderator that I've always wanted in all of my debates. But when I fail, which I will, I will at least have more compassion for moderators in my debates as well. The format for this evening begins with two 30-minute presentations. We'll begin with Dr. Ehrman, and following him will be Dr. Price. Then there will be a 10-minute break. 10-minute breaks are 10 minutes, not 15 or 20. Then there will be a 40-minute period of directed questions. Dr. Ehrman will have 10 minutes to ask Dr. Price questions. Then Dr. Price will have 10 minutes to ask questions, and then Ehrman and then Price again for a total of 40 minutes, and then we will open it up to audience questions. I'll say this again, perhaps later. Questions end in a question mark and do not begin with your life story and the history of everything you've ever done. <laughs> if you think for one moment that the guy who is famous for saying, no, 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 you're done and hanging up on people, is not going to cut your ass off and make you ask a question, you are at the wrong debate. You can tell from the applause that when I cut you off, while you might hate me, everybody else will love me. So this was encouragement for me to do it more. Let me introduce our, our uh, speakers and, and presenters for tonight. Uh, Dr. Robert Price is a former Baptist minister who holds PhDs in systematic theology and the New Testament. Dr. Price is a professor of biblical criticism at the Center for Inquiry Institute and will assert the Jesus myth theory viewpoint, which holds that there are flaws with the evidence for a historical Jesus and will make the case that he is no more than a mythological figure. Dr. Robert Price. Our second presenter, who I was pleased to meet yesterday for the first time, is Dr. Bart D. Ehrman. He's the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he has taught since 1988. Professor Ehrman has published extensively in the fields of New Testament and early Christianity, and will support the stance that there is strong evidence for the existence of a historical Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bart Ehrman. If our timekeeper is ready, we will go ahead and begin with Dr. Ehrman's 30-minute presentation supporting this. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. It's a lively crowd, I can tell. So uh, this is a uh, definitely uh, an unusual uh, experience for me. Just a second, let me get my timer going. Don't want Matt yelling at me. Uh, right, this is an unusual experience for me. I, I do a number of debates, uh, but uh, normally I'm debating uh, an evangelical Christian or a fundamentalist uh, about something of interest to fundamentalists, uh, such as uh, you know, whether the Bible, is, the Gospels are completely accurate or not, or uh, whether the historian can prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. 
Uh, normally, when I do these debates, I do them in front of a large fundamentalist or conservative evangelical audience. Uh, so the last one I did was in the Deep South, and there were like 600 people there. And uh, I started out the debate by, uh, we were debating on, I don't know what we were debating on, the resurrection or something. And so we started out the debate and I, I asked the audience, I said, so how many of you in here uh, consider yourselves committed Christians? Boom, everybody raises their hand. I said, okay, how many of you are convinced that Jesus was physically raised from the dead? Boom, everybody raises their hand. I said, okay, how many of you are here to see me get creamed? Boom, everybody raises their hand, oh my God. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's my, that's my normal experience. So uh, I've never had the experience where I uh, went in front of a crowd as the radical conservative. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an honor. It's a real honor to be here with you, and it's a privilege to share a stage with, uh, with Bob Price. Um, uh, but, okay, I do want to get the, the lay of the land here. How many of you would consider yourselves a committed Christian? How many of you are mythicists? How many of you are on the fence? Huh, okay. How many of you are open to changing your mind? Wow! Oh, my God. Now, look, look, you go to hell for lying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay. Okay, yeah, just one other question. How many of you are, uh, are going to vote for Hillary? How many of you are going to vote for Trump? <laughs> okay, well, this is, I, I, I had a choice of jokes to tell. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so now, now we know. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I just do want you to know that whatever, whatever happens tonight, uh, the debate's been rigged. <laughs> well, okay, so this is, uh, this is obviously an important uh, issue for, uh, for you, and uh, it should be an important issue for everybody. I mean, if, if Jesus didn't exist, that would be a big deal. Uh, there are two billion people in the world today who worship Jesus. Christianity completely changed Western civilization. There has been nothing like Christianity that has affected such change in the history of the West. Nothing. Uh, this is actually the topic of the book that I'm working on now, is how Christianity took over the Roman Empire. But uh, realize if Christianity had not become the religion of the West, we simply would not have the cultural history we've had. Whether you're thinking in terms of art or literature or music or architecture, uh, our lives would be incalculably different. If Jesus never lived, this is a religion based on a myth. I myself am not a believer in Jesus. But I do believe in history. And I believe it's important to know what actually happened in the past, even if we would prefer that something else had happened. Let me give you a brief synopsis of my position tonight. My brief synopsis is this. Whatever else you want to say about Jesus of Nazareth, I think you can say that he certainly existed. In my talk, I'm going to be mounting the positive arguments for that, some of the positive arguments, and we, ha we have only 30 minutes. Uh, if you've read uh, Bob's works, you know he could go for 30 days without repeating himself. So uh, we only have 30 minutes. So I'm going to give you uh, some of the stronger arguments that Jesus uh, certainly existed. I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on the arguments uh, on the other side. I'm not going to be spending time refuting mythicist arguments. For one thing, in this debate, you haven't heard any yet. So I'm not going to be refuting them. But I, am, I, I did want to start out just by saying a couple of things just to give you a sense for what, uh, what I think uh, it sometimes happens, which is that sometimes mythicists mount arguments that... that for me, at least, are not very convincing. And so I just want to give two of those before getting into the positive, into the positive side. Uh, again, not, not having a clue what Bob is going to say. Uh, first thing I want to say is uh, the, the first argument that I find completely unconvincing that uh, some of you uh, have heard and maybe have found convincing is the idea that Jesus of Nazareth could not have uh, existed because Nazareth did not exist. 
there was no Nazareth. I simply have never found this argument to be uh, anywhere close to persuasive for two reasons. One reason is, archaeologists have dug where ancient Nazareth was, and they've discovered that it was there. This is not a debated point among Palestinian archaeologists, several of which are good friends of mine. They don't debate whether Nazareth existed because they have dug it and they found it. There's, they've uncovered a house there. They've uncovered a farm there. They've uncovered pottery there. They've uncovered coins there. The pottery and the coins date to the days of Jesus. Certainly, Nazareth did exist. It's been shown to exist. Anyone who thinks otherwise simply doesn't know the archaeological record. I'm afraid it's that simple. The second reason for not being convinced by this, though, is this. Saying that Jesus did not exist because he could not have been born in Nazareth is like saying Barack Obama doesn't exist because he couldn't have been born in America. What everyone thinks about the birther issue, and judging from your show of hands, I think most of you don't subscribe to it, it's got nothing to do with whether Barack Obama actually exists or not. Same with Nazareth. Second, uh, second mythicist argument uh, that people make is that if Jesus' life, as described in the Gospels, follows a certain set patterns that you can see in Old Testament stories, or in myths about dying and rising gods, or in uh, uh, tales told about other religious figures, that if, there's, if these stories are in these set traditions, then probably Jesus didn't exist. I've never found this persuasive either. Most historical figures that we have accounts of have legendary to tales told about them in set patterns. That was true for George Washington. It's true for Julius Caesar. It's true for the founder of uh, Hasidic Judaism, the Baal Shem Tov, who allegedly could heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead and be transfigured before his, his, uh, his followers. Uh, does that mean he didn't exist? No, everybody knows that Baal Shem Tov existed. There's no doubt about that. I could, exist, I, I could illustrate this by giving point after point. Let me just give you one, one more detailed illustration. Octavian, Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor. Literally, he was allegedly the son of God. He was miraculously born. He was revered by, as the son of God by his devotees. He ascended to heaven. He is a divine being worthy of worship. There are all these tales told about him. Does that mean he didn't exist? No, it means that when you tell stories about him, you tell these stories in certain ways. This is typically what happens with important figures uh, from the past. Famous people are told in terms of stereotypes. We have our own stereotypes. We have the rags to riches story. We have the politician's sexual exploits story. We have the divine savior story. The fact that stories are molded to a model has no bearing on whether the person actually existed or not. Now let me get to my positive argument. Jesus of Nazareth is one of the best attested Palestinian Jews of the entire first century. From the year 1 of the Common Era, 1 CE, to the year 100 CE, we know that there were hundreds of thousands of Jews living in Palestine. How many of those Jews are better attested than Jesus? One. Josephus the historian. He's attested better only because he left us multiple writings. If you look only at external attestation for first century Palestinian Jews, Jesus actually is much better than Josephus. We have four gospels written about him. These gospels come from the very next generation after his life. Contrast that with Josephus. We have zero negative accounts of the Jewish historian Josephus. How many, do, how many uh, narrative accounts do we have for the most powerful religious figure in Jesus' day, Caiaphas, the high priest Caiaphas? We have no narrative accounts. How many narrative accounts do we have for Pontius Pilate, the most powerful man in first century Palestine? We have no narrative accounts. How many accounts do we have for anyone else in first century Palestine? We have no narrative accounts. It's not even close. I'm not saying that the gospel accounts are non-problematic. 
As some of you know, I've made, I've made an entire career out of arguing that they're problematic. <laughs> they, they, there are enormous problems with the Gospels. Uh, and so Bob and I are not going to be disagreeing about that. They are absolutely problematic. But they are four narratives about a person living in first century Palestine, and they do give us a lot of real information. These four Gospels we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not simply one Gospel in four forms. They are four Gospels based on different literary and oral sources. The Gospel of Mark was probably written sometime around the year 70 of the Common Era. Jesus died around the year 30 of the Common Era. Mark is absolutely based on oral traditions that the author had heard. Matthew and Luke used Mark as one of their sources, but they had other sources available to them. Matthew and Luke had one other source that they shared together that no longer exists. Scholars call it Q. Matthew had other sources that Luke did not have. Luke had other sources that Matthew did not have. That means prior to the writing of the Gospels, you've got sources for Mark, Different sources for Matthew and Luke, different sources for Matthew, different sources for Luke, and we're not even talking about John, which didn't use Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and had different sources of his own. These are multiple independent sources from the first century. How is it possible that you have so many sources about somebody who never existed? These sources are independent of each other. They're not copying one another. You have independent sources from before the Gospels. Some of these sources have traditions in them that almost certainly go back to Aramaic-speaking Palestine. Some of these sources record sayings of Jesus in which he uses Aramaic words known only in Palestine. Some of the sources contain stories that make sense if you translate them back into Aramaic, better sense than they make when they're given in Greek. That shows the story started out as Aramaic stories. You have Aramaic stories about Jesus from Palestine years before the Gospels. These are stories in Aramaic Palestine that almost certainly go back to the 30s of the Common Era. Multiple sources. This is far better than anybody that we have in Palestine in the entire first century. It's better than almost anybody we have in the ancient world, with, with exceptions that we all, we all could probably cite. Uh, sorry, my timer just went off. Ah, rats. OK, hold on a second. Yeah, right, you're just going to tell me to shut up. OK, I'm on this. Uh, right, hold on, sorry. 13 minus 17, thank you, okay, right. Um, we have writings of Paul. The Apostle Paul was not a follower of Jesus. He was living in a later generation. We have 13 letters that allegedly went under, that, that not allegedly went under Paul's name, that we have 13 letters that do go under Paul's name. Of these 13 letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, seven of them are letters that he actually wrote. There are six of the letters that, that Paul probably did not write. Seven letters that Paul really did write. The reason this is important is because Paul was writing before the Gospels. The Gospels were not the first books of the New Testament to be written. They were relatively late. Paul's writings were being produced in the 50s of the Common Era. In other words, about 25 years from the traditional date of Jesus' death, between 20 and 30 years of Jesus' traditional death. We can establish a relatively rough chronology for Paul's life. This chronology is going to be important for a couple of points that I want to make. The chronology of Paul's life is possible because in Paul's letters, he'll sometimes make an off-the-cuff biographical comment. Uh, three years ago, I did this. 14 years, 14 years later, I did this. So you get these biographical statements with years, and so based on that, you can reconstruct a, a chronology. If you know when he was writing, you can count backwards and figure out when what happened. Based on the chronology that is accepted by virtually everybody, Paul originally started out as a persecutor of Christians soon after Jesus' death, probably within two years of Jesus' death. Paul was a persecutor of the Christians. The fact that he was a persecutor of the Christians is interesting and important. 
If Paul converted in, say, the year 33, and he had been persecuting Christians based on what he heard about them in the year 32, that means Paul had heard about Christians and Christianity and about Jesus within two years of the traditional date of Jesus' death, probably about two years after Jesus had died. If that's the case, it would be worth knowing what does Paul know about the historical Jesus. Paul's views of Jesus are really important, as I think Bob and I would both agree. Paul does not talk about a heavenly cosmic figure, Joshua, or Jesus, who is crucified by demons in outer space, the way mythicists have often said. Paul talks about a real historical figure, Jesus, a Jew among Jews, a preacher teacher who was crucified by his earthly opponents. Yes, Paul thought that Jesus was a divine being who was also a human being. Paul does think that Jesus was a divine being who was also a human being. But he firmly believes that this divine being became a human being. Jesus was a Jew who lived, taught, and was crucified in Palestine. Paul is often faulted for not saying more about Jesus than he says. He doesn't talk about Jesus' baptism, his temptation, his Sermon on the Mount, his exorcisms, his triumphal entry, and lots of other things. He's faulted for not saying more on the grounds that if he knew more, he would have said more. That's possible, but it's not really probative. If you take seven of my mother's letters, my mother is a very, very devout Christian. If you take seven of her letters about religion, about her Christianity, about her faith, about her beliefs, you will not find any references to Jesus' baptism, temptation, Sermon on the Mount, exorcisms, or triumphal entry. She just doesn't talk about those things in her letters, and either did Paul. Does it show that my mother didn't, doesn't believe those things about Jesus' life? No, it doesn't show that. It's not what she's talking about. These letters that we have of Paul are letters that Paul wrote to his congregations to deal with problems that they were having. If they weren't having problems, then he, he didn't uh, write about them in his letters. What does Paul say? Paul tells us a number of important things about the historical Jesus based on what he knew. He indicates that Jesus was actually born physically, that he had a woman as his mother, that he came from the line of King David, that he was born a Jew, that he was a Jewish Messiah, that he had brothers, one of them was named James, he preached to other Jews, he had 12 disciples, one of them was Peter, whom Paul knew. Jesus was a teacher. Paul explicitly cites several of Jesus' teachings. Jesus had a last supper with his disciples. Jesus was crucified by the ruling authorities at the instigation of the Jewish authorities. Paul tells us these things. I want to focus on two points in particular that Paul, that Paul states about Jesus. The first is one that is central to uh, many of the debates uh, about mythicism. It comes in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, where Paul says that three years after his conversion, so this would be, by my chronology, about the year 35 or 36, the common era, he says, after three years, I went to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. I remained with him for 15 days. Cephas is Peter, Jesus' closest disciple. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. The brother of the Lord. Paul knows Jesus' brother, and he knows Jesus' closest disciple, Cephas. The word brother in the New Testament always means one of two things. A brother means a blood relative who's born to the same mother. That's one of the things it means. In other words, it means what brother means. The second thing it means is uh, it, it sometimes refers to, often refers to, members of the same believing community who stand in close solidarity. And so you can talk about your brothers, Jewish brothers, Christian brothers, depending on what your faith commitments are. Those are the two things that brother means in unambiguous cases in the New Testament. If anyone wants to claim that the word brother means something else, 
in any context, they're free to do that, but they need to have clear and compelling reasons for thinking so, other than the fact that they don't want to think that the word means what it means. In Paul's case, when he says that James was the brother of Jesus, what does he mean? He cannot mean simply that he was somebody who stood in close solidarity with Jesus because he's contrasting James with Cephas. He's explaining that he met with Cephas and with the brother of the Lord, James. In other words, Cephas is not the brother of the Lord. You get the same phenomenon in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, where Paul says that other people are allowed to take their wives with them, and so he too should be allowed to do so. Paul should be allowed to do so because other people take wives with them on their missions. And he says that Cephas doesn't, Apollos doesn't, Paul himself doesn't, but the brothers of the Lord do. That means that none of the others are the brothers of the Lord. Paul knew James. He spent weeks with James. He knew Peter, Jesus' closest disciple. If Jesus didn't exist, then surely his best friend and his brother would know about it. They didn't, they didn't know about it because he did exist. Second point about what Paul has to tell us. Paul understands that Jesus was the crucified Messiah. This is the important point. Paul understands Jesus as the crucified Messiah. Two things to say about that. First, if a first century Jew talked about someone who was crucified, what do they have in mind? Romans crucified people all the time. When people talked about crucified people, what did they mean? You can read any ancient source. Read Josephus if you want to. Read any ancient source. What do people mean when they talk about someone who's crucified? They talk about the same thing time after time after time. They mean somebody that the Romans nailed or tied to a cross in order to publicly humiliate and torture to death. That's what they mean. If Paul said that Jesus got crucified, what does he mean? He means the same thing. He doesn't mean that Jesus was killed in outer space by demonic power circling the globe. He's referring to a death that the Romans inflicted on criminals. That's what everybody means in the first century. Second, if Jesus did not exist, let's just say, suppose he did not exist, then necessarily the Christians invented him. And so the big question, if the Christians invented Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, the, the, the Messiah, the Christ, would they invent the idea that as the Messiah, he got crucified? If you work hard enough at it, you might be able to imagine inventing a god who got killed and raised from the dead, as many mythicists say. But that's not what Paul talks about. Paul doesn't talk about God who was crucified. God was crucified for you. Paul talks about Christ who was crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. We do nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and following, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried. By the way, he was buried. It's a little hard to do in the outer space. Christ was crucified. Would somebody make up a Messiah, specifically the Messiah, who was crucified? It's important to understand what Jews meant. Paul was a Jew. It's important to understand what Jews meant by the term Christ. In the days of Paul, there were some Jews who were expecting that a Messiah was going to come to the Jewish people sent from God. God would send a Messiah. The word Messiah actually comes from a Hebrew word, Mashiach, which means anointed one. Messiah is the same word as the Greek word Christ. Hebrew, is the, Hebrew word is Messiah, Greek word Christ. I have to tell my students this because many of my students think that Jesus Christ, Christ is his last name. <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ, born to Joseph and Mary Christ. <laughs> and it's, it's, it doesn't mean, it mean Jesus the Messiah. 
Jews had various expectations of what this Messiah would be, the anointed one. This is a term that was originally used in Jewish scriptures to refer to the king of Israel. He was the anointed one. When the king was anointed at his coronation ceremony, like King David, King Solomon, this showed that God was putting his favor upon him. In Jesus' day, there hadn't been a king on the throne for nearly 600 years. Some people thought there would be a king on the throne, and they called him the anointed one, the Messiah. The Messiah was going to be a great warrior figure like David, a great warrior who drove out the enemy and set up God's kingdom by establishing a throne in Jerusalem, and Israel would once more be a sovereign state that would rule over its enemies. That's what the Messiah would do. Some Jews thought that the Messiah would be a cosmic figure who would destroy the forces of evil and set up God's kingdom on earth, a mighty cosmic judge. There were various expectations of what the Messiah would be, but there was one thing that all of the expectations had in common. Jews who expected a Messiah expected a great, powerful figure who would destroy the enemy and set up God's kingdom. And who was Jesus? The Christians said that Jesus was a crucified criminal. If you wanted to make up a story about the Messiah, would you make up the story that the Messiah had been crucified? That's the opposite of what the Messiah is supposed to be. If you want to make up a story about a Messiah, you'd make up the story that, well, he actually drove out the Romans and he is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Why didn't they make up that story? Because it obviously wasn't true. The early Christians were not going around saying that God had been crucified. They were saying that Christ had been crucified. Well, why did they do that? if it didn't make any sense to expect a crucified Messiah. It was because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah and they knew that he got crucified. You can't explain the crucified Messiah as something that was made up. The crucified Messiah is because people thought Jesus was the Messiah and they knew that this man had been killed as a crucified criminal. That's why Paul says that the crucifixion of Jesus was the greatest stumbling block for Jews. It was the one reason most Jews rejected the Christian claim that Jesus was the Messiah. Most Jews thought the claim was crazy. It was absurd. The Messiah is crucified. Well, I mean, it's like a contradiction in terms. Of course it wasn't crucified. So why did Christians say it? They had no choice because they knew that the man Jesus had been crucified. Let me sum up. Jesus is one of the best, two best, attested Palestinian Jews of the first century. We have numerous sources that talk about him. These sources give us valuable information. The sources are problematic. They are historically difficult. Historians spend their lives trying to figure out what in them is historical and what is not. That does not mean that there's nothing historical in them. There is historical information in them. You have to find it. Included with the historical sources, though, are also the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul, within two years of Jesus' life, absolutely knew that he was a historical figure, that he was a Jewish preacher and teacher who ended up on the wrong side of the law and was crucified by the Roman authorities. Let me end with a final word, something that I tell my students, my Christian students in North Carolina, but I think it would be appropriate here as well. That is that on this or any other topic, I hope you do not decide to believe only what's convenient. I have to tell my students this. Only what you want to believe or what you would like to be right. If you want to know if something is true, you should look at the evidence and then decide. If you decide that it's true, you should accept it and deal with it. It may change your broader perspective or it may not, but in either case, you will at least be basing your perspective on what you have reason to believe to be true. Thank you very much.
And now, Dr. Bob Price will present the mythicist position. Is there a man behind the curtain? I guess you might say that uh, I think not only that there is no great and powerful Oz, but that there's not even a man behind the curtain. Bart, on the other hand, agrees Oz is an illusion, but if you pull back the curtain, you'll find the anticlimactic Professor Marvel. Uh, first, is Christ mythicism some kind of novelty dreamed up by skeptics living far enough after the events to be able to get away with it? Uh, Bart and many others think so. Uh, quote, uh, he says, the idea that Jesus did not exist is a modern notion. It has no ancient, antece uh, ancient pre precedence. Uh, quote again, even the enemies of the Jesus movement thought that Jesus had existed. Among their many slurs against the religion, his non-existence is never one of them, close quote. I'm not so sure of that. Justin Martyr ascribes to his dialogue partner Trifo uh, the uh, allegation, quote, you have received a futile rumor and have created some sort of Christ for yourselves, end quote. We always hear apologists explain this away as if it meant you Christians have nominated your own Christ, or you Christians pretend your Jesus was the Christ. But uh, that's rather different. Uh, would the rabbi have said that the partisans of Simon Bar Kokhba had created their own Messiah? I don't think so. It seems less contrived to take Trifo as charging that the Christian savior was a figment of pious imagination. Celsus, the second century critic of Christianity, says, according to Origen, it is clear to me that the writings of the Christians are a lie and that your fables have not been well enough constructed to conceal this monstrous fiction. And then there's good old 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we told you of the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. Now, it's interesting. Some are alleging that we, ostensibly Simeon Peter, as the letter starts, and his colleagues were devising myths about the coming of Jesus. That sounds to me like an accusation uh, that Christians had fabricated the whole business. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that's what happened, right? I'm just saying that that was an, an ancient view. Well, I picture the emergence of Jesus Christ like that moment when, in the process of evolution, enough small mutations accumulate to cross the taxonomical line to amount to a new species. Old myths mutated and morphed over a long time. But uh, Bart is attacking the committee invention model of Jesus. Uh, and I think that's a straw man, though it's one created by mythicists. Uh, the, uh, well, yeah, uh, I, uh, that they like network execs sitting around, uh, you know, what are we gonna do with the protagonist of this show? Uh, uh, I think that is absurd. And I believe I detect here, however, a fault line running beneath his whole argument. Uh, at least uh, 14 times that I counted in Did Jesus Exist? Bart says we can trace traditions of Jesus back to within a very few years of Jesus' supposed crucifixion. Uh, for Bart, mythicism assumes that schemers invented Jesus at the same point in history when the Gospels have Jesus appear. But if there was no historical Jesus, as we wild-eyed, tinfoil, hat-wearing mythicists I know I am, uh, anyway, um, uh, suggest the bottom falls out of the whole thing. There's no way to determine when the timeline began. No way to say what or when counts as early. To say, for instance, quote, in nearly all our sources, Peter was Jesus' most intimate companion and confidant for his entire public ministry after his baptism, end quote, seems to presuppose the factual character of the narrative, which is just the pointed issue. Uh, I think that's like invoking Dr. Watson as a witness to a historical Sherlock. 
Well, Bart well expresses and then deconstructs a common mythicist objection to Jesus' historical existence. Um, how could non-Christian writers have ignored a man who performed miracle after miracle to great public acclaim? But Bart replies, the contemporary writers would probably not have taken much notice of any historically plausible Jesus, an itinerant sage and faith healer, one who did not miraculously multiply food, turn water into wine, walk on water, raise the rotting dead, uh, banish uh, storms at sea, and so forth. Isn't this like asking whether the historical Superman really had superhuman powers beyond those of ordinary men? Should we decide that there was indeed a historical Superman, but that he was merely Clark Kent? Um, Bart says, you can shape a tradition about Jesus any way you want so that it looks highly legendary, but that has no bearing on the question of whether the legendary shaping uh, whether beneath the legendary shaping lies the core of the historical event. Well, let's try to imagine what some of these hypothetical pre-legendary original stories might have looked like. Could this be the, his, the original core behind Mark 5, 1 through 13? They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and a great herd of swine was grazing on the hillside. But immediately some wild dogs began to bark, and the swine took fright and stampeded down the steep hillside, and they were drowned in the sea, the end. Uh, or how about a possible historical core of Mark uh, 521 and following? When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him. He was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and besought him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And Jesus said to him, my poor man, you have my sympathies. Now who's up for lunch? Uh, it, could this be the historical core of Mark 6, 32 through 44? As he went ashore, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, it grew late his disciples came to him and said, this is a lonely place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the country and the surrounding villages and buy themselves something to eat. And he answered them, you have said it. And he dispersed the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied. Or one more, could this be the basis of Mark 6, 45 to 51? Immediately he dismissed the crowd and he made his disciples get into the boat to go to the other side, to Bethsaida, and he got into the boat with them. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea. Um, what's left? Uh, who would even have remembered these unremarkable incidents if in fact they happened? And why would it have occurred to anyone to embellish them? In terms of evolution, these tepid anecdotes would have had no survival value. To treat such gospel episodes the way Bart suggests, if I'm hearing him right, is to trim away the element that would have caused the story to be passed on in the first place. It sounds like the old-time Protestant rationalism ridiculed by D.F. Strauss, boiling the spectacular down to the mundane just to provide a toehold on historical reality. This is a modern version of ancient euhemerism, the attempt to salvage the myths of the gods and heroes by positing that they were mythologized versions of ancient celebrities. Osiris was a king, Ares a mighty warrior, Asclepius a doctor, Hercules a weightlifter, Apollo the owner of a tanning salon. Um, <laughs> Could the Christian religion have begun with the modest historical figure Bart and his colleagues have whittled from the oak of the Gospels? There was no such historical figure. Jesus possesses the grandeur of the mythical demigods because that's what he was. That's why no contemporary historian mentions him. Uh, section subheading, Testimonium Flimsianus. Did Jesus come in for mention by ancient historians? 
Bart regards the well-known statements of Pliny the Younger and Cornelius Tacitus about Christos and Crestus as textually authentic as they may well be. But as he readily admits, these writers quite likely learned what they said about Christ, not Jesus, interestingly, from Christians. Uh, here are multiple attestations of hearsay. The weakness and scantiness of these attestations only accentuate the paucity of the supposed non-Christian documentation of a historical Jesus. And then we have to ask, why are the Gospels witnesses to Jesus any better founded? Bart says that, quote, stories about Jesus circulated widely throughout the major urban areas of the Mediterranean from a very early time. Our written sources are based on oral traditions. In other words, hearsay, just like Pliny and Tacitus. Thomas Arnold famously said that the resurrection of Jesus was the best attested fact in history. But as R.G. Collingwood observed, it's being well attested only proves that a lot of people believed it, not that it happened. Did Josephus mention Jesus? Bart says, quote, the majority of scholars of early Judaism and experts on Josephus think that one or more Christian scribes touched up the passage a bit. If one takes out the obviously Christian comments, the passage may have been rather innocuous, uh, end of quote. Nothing like he was the Messiah, right? No resurrection appearances, which the you know, standard text of Josephus mentions. Bart ventures that, quote, the pared down version of Josephus contains very little that could have been used by the early Christian writers to defend Jesus and his followers from attacks by pagan intellectuals, end quote. His point is that the unspectacular version cannot have begun as a wholesale Christian interpolation, so it must be genuine to Josephus, right? But my question would be, why would Josephus mention such a non-entity? Who does the Daily Planet report on, Superman or Clark Kent? Uh, no, the scaled down version of the passage omitting he was the Christ and the resurrection appearances makes as little sense as the authentic words of Josephus as they do as a Christian interpolation. Paul J. Hopper, an authority on the linguistics of classical literature, has, in my opinion, decisively refuted the scaled-down non-interpolation theory. He compares the testimonium treatment of Pilate uh, with the adjacent Pilate episodes in the context in Josephus and concludes that the testimonium is, after all, a Christian interpolation intended to rehabilitate the image of Jesus and to shift the blame for his death from Pilate to the Jews. In the authentic Pilate stories, the procurator initiates actions against the Jews, but in the testimonium, he is manipulated by the Jewish leaders. Jesus is no more of a protagonist. Everything said of him occurs by way of allusions uh, and, a, at, and at arm's length. In summary fashion, all aimed at vindicating the Christian movement in the writer's day. That is to say, despite all this, the faith goes on, quote, and up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out, which is kind of interesting in the pared down version, um, the uh, Christ doesn't occur, he's Jesus, so Christians couldn't have been named after another name than, uh, than Jesus, I should think. The testimonium first appears in Eusebius' demonstration of the gospel, our copies of Josephus, are centuries later than that, and many scholars have suggested it was Eusebius's writing falsely ascribed to Josephus that crept into our later copies of Josephus. Ken Olson shows how, whereas the testimonium passage sticks out like a sore thumb in the text of the antiquities where scribes inserted it, thinking they were restoring an accidental scribal omission, the passage fits its Eusebian context so well that well, you'd think it was made for the purpose, and it was. The particular things said about Jesus in the testimonium all address specific pagan criticisms of Christian beliefs about Jesus current in Eusebius' own day, and which Eusebius is pointedly discussing in the context. 
Bart dismisses suggestions that this or that historical Jesus-leaning passage in Paul's epistles is a subsequent interpolation. He says, quote, here we find textual studies driven by convenience. If a passage contradicts your views, simply claim that it was not written by the author, end quote. But aren't consensus scholars doing the same darn thing with the testimonium Flavianum? They dearly want Josephus to have mentioned Jesus, but the passage as it stands, they admit, cannot have been the work of a non-Christian Jew like Josephus. It's a bad text for their purposes, so they redact it, as Matthew redacted Mark, in order to make it suitable for their use. Just exercise the line item veto. Remove the offending passages. Now we can use it as evidence to establish a historical Jesus. Uh, no, no you can't. Uh, subtitle, Bridge to Nowhere. Most Jesus scholars believe one can build a bridge from the canonical gospels over to the historical Jesus. Suppose the gospels themselves are based on prior gospels. That helps, but if we run out of planks, maybe we can close the rest of the distance by tossing sturdy ropes of oral tradition over to the other side. Bart enumerates the pre-gospel gospels, the hypothetical sources used by Matthew and Luke, namely Mark, which of course we know exists, Q, M, and L. Matthew and Luke each used both Q and Mark, where Matthew presents material not found in Mark or Q, he got it from, from M. Uh, in the same way, stories and sayings unique to Luke must have been borrowed from L. And for all we know, Mark, M, and L, like Q, may be compilations of earlier oral or written sources. But Walter Schmittals demonstrates to my satisfaction that all the uniquely Lucan parables are either drawn from general Hellenistic Judaism or composed by Luke himself to serve his special interests in persecution, prayer, possessions, etc. Schmittals argues that all the uniquely Matthean parables are his own creations. He notes, too, that if Luke and Matthew were really drawing on streams of oral tradition, it seems remarkable that we should find no overlaps between them, that is, no non-verbatim parallels. But in his Gospel's preface, doesn't Luke refer to numerous predecessors? Yes, but I think Luke is trying to do what Bart is trying to do, to provide a possibly fictive paper trail back to Jesus. The fabricator, fabricators of Islamic hadith, ostensible traditions of what the prophet Muhammad uh, had said and did, always supplied an attestation chain or isnad for their fabrications. I heard this from Abdul al-Hazred, who heard it from Raz al-Ghul, who heard it from Abu Bakr, who heard it from uh, the prophet, peace be upon him. Luke is supplying an isnad. It is part and parcel of Luke's apologetic motif of eyewitness apostolic guarantors. There's a fine point in the apologetical exploitation of source criticism that we shouldn't skip over. Q, for instance, is a helpful theoretical model for organizing the data of the Gospels. Um, others cut the pie in other ways. Uh, Q, uh, Q, M, and L are theoretical, purely hypothetical, not known but lost documents like the Gospel according to the Hebrews. Bart also appeals to the Gospels of Thomas and Peter and the so-called Edgerton Gospel as independent witnesses to a recent and therefore historical Jesus, but many think these texts are heavily dependent on the canonical Gospels. Something that is itself a matter of intense debate can hardly be taken for granted as a building block for one's case. Subtitle, oh, isn't this is so clever, Risky Patristics. Uh, Papias was a bishop of Hierapolis in Asia Minor. Uh, around 125, he wrote a work now lost except for several quotations by church fathers called The Exposition of the Oracles of Our Lord. It is very difficult to grant any credibility to a man who says he heard from the hearers of the holy apostles that Judas Iscariot had swollen up to the size of a parade balloon, unable to squeeze between two street corners and urinated live maggots before he exploded. 
I don't mean to suggest that Bart is willing to accept such nonsense. He doesn't explicitly rejects it. But the astonishing thing is that even in the face of this, he still accepts Papias as an important source. Again, to appeal to such a worthless source only underlines the paucity of the evidence. Did Papias get this tradition from associates of the apostles? If he says he did, then his claim to apostolic hobnobbing must be considered just as fanciful. You know, skip comments on Ignatius of Antioch. Paul's Jesus. What do the Pauline epistles tell us about Jesus? Bart says, quote, he never mentions Pontius Pilate or the Romans, but he may have had no need to do so. His readers knew full well what he was talking about. If they were already fully informed about Jesus, then there was no need for Paul to remind them that Jesus walked on water, raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, and was executed in Jerusalem. But so, end of quote, but suppose his readers were familiar with at least the first two stories, Bart believes such stories are pure legends. If the Corinthians or the Thessalonians knew about these miracles, that doesn't mean they knew anything about a historical Jesus. What is at issue in the question of Paul not mentioning Pilate or the Sanhedrin as culprits in Jesus' death? Paul never describes the crucifixion as a mundane execution at the hands of earthly governing authorities, though of course nothing he says rules out that possibility. What he does say is that Jesus was done to death by the rulers or archons of this ion, uh, the principalities and powers. Mythicists infer that the author of these epistles was writing at a time when Christians believed in a celestial man of light who had not appeared on the earth to teach and heal and die on a Roman cross, but who had been ambushed and slain by the demonic entities inhabiting the lower heavens. As we read in various surviving Gnostic texts, this death would have occurred in the primordial past. His slayers harvested the sparks of his light body and used them to seed the inert mud pie creations of the demiurge, imparting life and motion to them, beginning with Adam. Thus the death of the primal light man turned out to be a life-giving sacrifice, just like that of the Vedic Purusha. Eventually, the revealer was sent forth from the divine world of light to regather the divine photons, redeeming them from the imprisonment of this world of solid flesh. The Gnostics naturally considered themselves to be the elite light bearers who had heeded the call of the revealer, manifest among men in the form of Gnostic apostles. At some point, some of these Gnostics historicized their salvation myth envisioning the sacrificial death of the man of light is taking place down here in the sublunar world. At first, the coming of this Christ was understood as what we would call a hologram, an illusion of physical presence among mortal men and women. The enlightened could discern the purely spiritual character of the Savior, while those mired in mundane consciousness took him for a man of flesh. Eventually, this unenlightened, genuinely incarnational Christology became normative. The Pauline literature would represent a prehistoricized version of Gnostic Christian belief or a faction which retained the earlier version when others had adopted a historicized Christology. Uh, this is the model that makes most sense to me. Right, a thing like this, you, as Bart says, this is not probative. You can't prove this unless you've got a time machine. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a question of what paradigm makes most sense of the evidence to, to one, and this is what makes the most sense to me. Paul, quote, Bart says, refers on several occasions to Jesus' teachings, end of quote. Uh, what? Where? Well, of course, Bart is referring to two passages from 1 Corinthians. Quote, to the married I give charge, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. Are we so sure Paul is quoting a saying of the historical Jesus and not passing on a command vouchsafed to him by the ascended Christ? I think the latter is more likely. We cannot be sure Paul does not mean he has a historical Jesus quote on hand, but if this notion of Paul passing on private oracles is even a plausible suggestion, 
then uh, you can't just assert that he is quoting the historical Jesus. The same applies to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, where Paul quotes the words of institution of the Eucharist. Conservative apologists contend that the words, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, imply that Paul is repeating an account given him by his apostolic predecessors, an account of Jesus' Last Supper. The received, delivered language uh, is familiar from rabbinic tradition, but especially in Paul, it can just as easily mean the opposite. Uh, as in Galatians 1, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel that was preached by me is not according to men, for I did not receive it from men, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Note the similarity to I received from the Lord in 1 Corinthians 11.23. Why doesn't it denote in 1 Corinthians what it most certainly does in Galatians? We may also compare the situation of the Gospels and the Pauline epistles to that of the Synoptics versus John. As Morris Casey notes, it is obvious that the unique and powerful sayings and discourses attributed to Jesus in John's Gospel cannot be authentic sayings of the historical Jesus because no such materials, the I am discourses and so on, appear in the Synoptics. Is it reasonable to argue that Jesus really said such things, but that none of it had reached the ears of the synoptists? Of course not. As all critical scholars admit, these sayings did not exist, hence were not circulating in the period when Q, Mark, and Matthew, throw in M and L if you want, were being written. They arose within the sectarian community of the beloved disciple later on. Shouldn't we understand the absence of Jesus' sayings and stories from the Pauline literature in the same way? It simply did not yet exist, or we should be seeing some of it in the epistles. Subtitle, Mythicist Mischief. Is it possible that any texts in the Pauline epistles that imply belief in a recent historical Jesus might be secondary scribal insertions? Bart does not suffer interpolation theories gladly. Quote, it is only the mythicists who have a vested interest in claiming that Paul did not know of a historical Jesus, who insist that these passages were not originally in Paul's writings. One always needs to consider the source. End quote. The trouble is that these suggestions were not made by mythicists. Uh, William O. Walker, Jr. discusses a whole raft of proposed early interpolations, not one of them the proposal of a mythicist. Each suggestion comes with its own reasoning. A.D. Howell Smith, in his Jesus Not a Myth, showed how Galatians 1, 18 through 19 might have been interpolated. He says, unless the allusion is interpolated, Paul had an interview with the brother of Jesus, who was one of the three pillars of the church in Jerusalem, Galatians 1.19. There is a critical case of some slight cogency against the authenticity of Galatians 1.18 and 19, which was absent from Marcion's Apostolicon, his collection of Pauline epistles. The word again in Galatians 2.1, which presupposes the earlier passage, seems to have been interpolated as it is absent from Irenaeus' full and accurate citation of this section of the epistle to the Galatians in his treatise Against Heretics. J.C. O'Neill, in the recovery of Paul's letter to the Galatians, contended that Galatians 1, 4 through 5 originally com comprised a short creedal affirmation in poetic form added by a scribe. Jean Mang, if I'm saying it right, uh, in From Christianity to Gnosis and From Gnosis to Christianity, argues that 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 was interpolated in order to authorize a certain innovations in the Eucharistic service. I have made a case that 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 11 was interpolated into its present context, but then I don't count since I'm a crazy mythicist. But little did I suspect that others, not mythicists, had beat me to the punch. Winsome Monroe suspects uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, of belonging to a subsequent post-Pauline stratum of the epistle, while J.C. O'Neill also deems it most probable that 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11 is a later creedal summary not written by Paul. 
our Joseph Hoffman speaks of the interpolative character of 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8. None of them mythicists. Oops, 30 seconds. Okay, well, so much for the scandal of the cross. Let me just say that uh, I don't think they had to invent a, a crucified Messiah because I believe that the righteous Davidic king is a scaled down version of what was originally in ancient Israel, the myth of the sacred king, who was God's representative on earth, could even be called God, and went through the uh, annually the uh, the uh, myth of how Yahweh became king of the gods by killing the chaos dragons, being devoured and, and emerging alive again, and then taking the throne of, of the gods and uh, creating the world. So this, uh, Margaret Barker shows this kind of stuff is still around in the time of the book of Revelation. And uh, it wasn't orthodox Deuteronomic Judaism, but probably provided the categories for early Christian Christology. So we've shown that I am going to hold people to the clock. You have 10 minutes for a break, and we'll come back for questions. If you come in after the 10-minute mark, please try and take your seat quietly, because we're starting. I've tried to change the nature of debates so that they are much more conversational and rather than join press conferences, and I'm happy for the cross-examination period. It's the part where I get the most out of it, it's the part where I think the audience might get the most out of it, because you get to watch people think, and that is always uh, edifying. In the 10 minutes, it will start with uh, Dr. Ehrman first. He has 10 minutes to ask questions of Dr. Price, and please remember that the, the question time belongs to the person asking the questions. So please don't think it's rude if one, whoever the questioner is happens to interrupt to redirect if they think something's gone astray or they need to clarify a point. This is their time to use. And we'll do 10 minutes beginning now with Dr. Ehrman. Okay, thank you. Is this on? Is this on? You can hear me okay? Good. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Bob, for a very, uh, very interesting uh, and informative talk. I appreciate it very much. So I've got, uh, I, I have 163 questions. Um, so uh, I, think, I think what I'm going to do is just kind of start where you started. So I was a little surprised when you said that ancient people like Trypho and Celsus uh, held to a, something like a mythicist view. Um, isn't it true that both Trypho and Celsus explicitly talk about Jesus' birth and his baptism and his death by crucifixion in order to, to show that these were natural events and not supernatural events? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, I noticed that, uh, and it seems to me that the only way to make sense out of this is that they're going on to say, well, this is your story. Let's see if it has any plausibility, and so that he's uh, uh, elaborating on how it's it's incompetent as okay, a myth. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I don't read it that way at all. I think, I mean, it, all of these texts are readily available, and they're very interesting texts. I encourage everybody to read them, the dialogue with Trifo. Uh, dialogue with Trifo by Justin and the contra the, the against Celsus that you find in origin where he quotes Celsus's views and it's pretty clear that the Celsus believes that Jesus was born and that he was baptized and he was tempted that he was crucified I mean he, he's quite explicit about it. I noticed when you're talking about my view uh, in that little segment you had first quoted uh, Trifo that the Christ you have created for yourself then later you quoted me as saying something about traditions that uh, from a few years within, uh, a few years before Jesus was supposedly crucified, or before the supposed crucifixion, it seems like you could take me to say, "Well, Jesus wasn't really crucified; he was only." And was, I think you're reading Trifo that way, rather than because the, these guys uh, they they spend their treatises showing that the Christian interpretation of the events is wrong, but they never deny that Jesus was born or baptized or crucified. Well, let me, let me get to the next question. Uh, several times you, you uh, expressed your uh, surprise that contemporary authors did not mention Jesus if he you know, was really a significant figure. Uh, so these same contemporary authors, how often do they mention the most powerful religious figure in Jesus' day, Caiaphas? Or how often do they mention the most 
significant Jew of the first century, Josephus? Well, uh, with, I believe in somewhere in the Mishnah they refer to the serpents of the house of Annas, which I take it to mean uh, that they uh, knew about this whole bunch of people. I always like to point that out because I have to defend the Gospels uh, with the idea that if you say that they say any Jews were involved in the death of Jesus is anti-Semitism. And I point out, well, no, Jews, like the ones that eventually put the priesthood to the sword, uh, they, they uh, knew about them, mentioned them, didn't like them, thought they were quislings, which they were. Um, but I, did, did he, uh, well, what I'm saying is if Jesus were merely on that level or like the exorcist that Joseph, uh, Josephus mentions, uh, why would they come in? Why would Jesus come in for mention? Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But, I mean, it's a common mythicist argument that, that, that Jesus is never mentioned in any Greek or Roman source of the first century. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand the argument, but, I mean, either is Caiaphas, who is the most significant religious leader of the time, and either is Josephus, who's the best documented figure of the first century. He's never mentioned in any of these sources. But these so guys, why, why would Jesus be? Well, because he's a miracle working. No, superman. I'm not. I don't think he was a miracle worker. That's, but that's the kind. That's what I mean by saying with they, the Daily Planet have reported on Clark Kent. But, uh, he's but an the fact, the fact that they don't mention a Jew from Palestine is not surprising. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But but it doesn't show he didn't exist. No, well, the idea is no. I, I fully agree. I mean, because like you if, don't you don't think it's an argument that Caiaphas didn't exist. Yeah, but there's no, they wouldn't have been taken advantage of as a miracle-working demigod. But, but I don't think he was a miracle-working. But then it's no surprise. That, it, it indeed, is no surprise we don't have mentions they of They don't them. mention any first-century Jew. But if Jesus was that insignificant, is that a sufficient cause he's for He's not that insignificant. He's, he's like every other Jew of the first century. They don't mention them. I okay, let's let, let, let's move on because we only have a ten minute. But so okay, so it, actually, my next thing is about this point there, where you you were saying that um, that when you strip away the myth, it's an interesting argument. When you strip away the myth from these stories, there's like nothing left. It's kind of banal and uninteresting. And so why would you even tell the story? It's 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 an interesting point. But the the examples you picked, um, let me see. What do I, I can't even read my own? You picked a couple examples. For example, the feeding of the five thousand. I think was one of your examples, but. I mean, I don't think there was a feeding of the 5,000. So uh, I don't see how this is an argument. I mean, I, I don't... Well, what is it that got beefed up into these miracle stories? What, I don't think anything got beefed up into the miracle. I don't think that what you do is you read the miracle stories and then you strip away a miracle and you say, that's what happened. That's not my method. I've well, never used like that method. Well, those are cameos of the whole idea that Jesus was just you know, Joe Rabbi. No, I don't think it was Joe Rabbi. Look, I wrote an entire book on what we can say about the historical Jesus. So, uh, you know, it's, I don't know what it is, 250 pages long. So it's not as if there's nothing you can say. There's a lot you can say without conceding a single miracle. But the way you get there is not by reading the miracle of the 5,000 and saying that they just really just had a picnic. I mean, as you know, I mean, you, you, you know this as well as I do. In, in the 19th century, there were, um, there were historians like uh, Heinrich Pallas who did just that. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. And Albert Schweitzer showed you can't do it that way. And today, nobody does it that way. So I think you're, I think you're uh, beating a straw man because that's not how any of us proceeds. How, how are we supposed to know how much time we have, by the way? I've got three minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, as you, as you know, the, the, the way people go about it is not simply by stripping miraculous things out of the Gospels. What they do is they evaluate every story to see whether there's anything historical in it. For example, uh, the, the baptism. You know, is there anything historical in there or not? The way you do it is not just by taking out the miracle bits, the way you were saying it happens with Josephus. So, okay, okay, look, I do need to get on. Uh, Josephus, yes, okay, I mentioned Josephus. Let me talk about Josephus for a second. Uh, no, I don't want to talk about Josephus. I decided not to ask that one. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Not enough okay. is the answer. Okay, I can do this. Three minutes, right, okay. Uh, right, uh, one of our big disagreements is about Paul's understanding of the death of Jesus. When Paul says that the archons of this Ion killed him, you take this to mean that there are these celestial powers up in the heavenly places, and you take it in a Gnostic sense. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so the question is, what does Paul mean by the term archon, and what does he mean by the term Ion? So Paul uses these terms in other places. 
What does he mean when he says archon? None of them seem to me to be references to earthly rulers, not even Romans uh, It's Romans 13.3. 13, it's quite clear he's talking about earthly rulers. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think. I know it's usually taken that way, but I uh, think the, the tribute rendered unto listen, the rulers. Here, here's what he says. He says, be subject to every governing authority, for there is no authority except from God. Therefore, he who resists authority resists what God has appointed. For the archons are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Who, would you have no fear of him who is in authority? He's talking about ruling, author, governing authorities. Well, uh, on the one hand, if he does mean that, uh, we have the, the oddity of him saying, the, it's only the wicked God punishes, you mean like Jesus? Would a guy say that if he thought Jesus had been unjustly, judicially murdered by the, the authorities? Yes, he apparently did say that, and so did First Peter. I mean, this is a common right, trope. It's problem. a common trope in early Christianity. Through, after the New Testament period, you have all sorts of authors who say uh, that, that Jesus was killed by the authorities and you should obey the authorities. I mean, it, it may not make sense to us, but the reason they're saying this is because they don't want to cause any more problems. They don't want Christians to be doing things against the law. Uh, so, and the, the idea that the Ions are referring to Gnostic myths uh, okay, so I just encourage everybody to read up about Gnosticism. So what, what, when do you date the Gnostic myths? I think they go way back and uh, evolved from Judaism, though with some cross-pollination from other sources, as you see in the Nag Hammadi text. It's already a Zoroastrian and Platonic elements, but I think Margaret Barker is right in that it comes from, from Judaism. Well, it may come from Judaism, but Gnostic, Gnostic scholars today, of course, you, when you and I were back in graduate school, back in the Pleistocene age, the, uh, you know, pe people did... People did think that Gnosticism was a pre-Christian set of religions, but Gnosticism today is normally understood to be a second century phenomenon, that it didn't predate, predate Paul. And so no, nobody talks about Gnosticism as a predecessor of Paul because these, these texts that we have post-date Paul. The Nag Hammadi Library is all second century stuff. So I don't think you can use second century texts in order to show that this is the background of letters written in the 50s. So, so my time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, I tend to go with uh, uh, with Boltmann and Reitzenstein and others. Their arguments persuade me that it was, uh, and Schmittals, that uh, these things were pre-Christian and yes, non-Christian. In the 1950s, that's what they thought, but they don't... We have now started Dr. Price's right. 10 minutes. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, right. okay. You've used three of your now, minutes. But, but please, it's your, your first 10 minutes I'm for just questions. Kidding. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I would like to ask one question. Um, in, I, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, did Jesus, uh, good God, snap out of it, Christ. Uh, the, uh, how Jesus became God. At one, I think that's the book where you say that you changed your mind on whether the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and the women disciples visiting the empty tomb, that you, you suspect now that that is, is not historical. Am I misremembering that? Or if I'm not, how did you make the transition? Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, uh, so whenever I debate these uh, Christian apologists, which is what I'm usually doing with my life, as you know, uh, they, uh, they always argue that there are two facts that everybody agrees on about the resurrection of Jesus, that, that uh, the tomb is empty and, uh, and Jesus appeared to people. And they say you have to explain these two facts, and if you can't explain these two facts, then you have to agree that Jesus was raised from the dead. So this is, you, you've heard this a trillion times, so have I. So um, I actually do agree that uh, the follower, some, of, some of the followers of Jesus believe that he appeared to them. I absolutely think that that's true. I think they had some kind of visions, but I don't think, I don't think Jesus appeared to them. I don't think Jesus rose from the dead. I think people, people have visions of deceased loved ones. It happens sometimes, and some of them did, so I think that's true. I, when I was writing that book, I came to think uh, something that before that I thought was crazy, which is I, I came to think there really was no empty tomb. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the story about Joseph of Arimathea is a historical account. Um, and the reason I came to that is this. I, I decided to look up every reference that I could find in every Greek and Latin author of antiquity uh, who mentions crucifixion and to see what they say about crucifixion. 
And one of the striking things is um, that we have no literary descriptions of crucifixion. In other words, we don't have any text that tells us uh, this is how they did it. You know, they nailed them, or they tied them, or they did this. This is how they set the cross up. There's no descriptions of this, because, apparently because everybody knew how it happened, I, would, I suppose, but they don't describe it. One thing that does get described a lot, though, is, or a relative amount, I mean, is that Romans left the bodies on the cross. They did not take them down when they died. Uh, part of the punishment of crucifixion was that the, uh, the body was left to decompose and to be subject to the scavenging animals. So you have references to this in our sources. And so I came to think, you know, if, that's, if that was part of the punishment, that you'd be humiliated even after death and would not be allowed a decent burial, if that was part of the point of crucifixion in Roman, in Roman circles, then would they have made an exception in the case of Jesus? And, you know, it's not like they would say, well, he's the son of God, so let's give him a decent burial. You know, so, uh, so I, I came to think that probably they did not give him a decent burial. And so that the, the story of Joseph of Arimathea was probably a later legend that was invented precisely so Christians could say there was an empty tomb. But I don't think there was an empty tomb. Yeah, because I don't think... So my guess is what they did is they... Um, they, cru they crucified him. They probably left him on the cross and then probably disposed of the remains, probably just chucked him in a common grave like they do with most people, be my guess. Um, what do you think of uh, Burton Mack's argument in a couple of his books that, that scholars should give up the idea of the resurrection, whatever it was, as the big bang that started Christianity. And he said, and perhaps there were all sorts of uh, Christian and Jesus communities, some of whom found it in their interest to use resurrection uh, imagery, others didn't, and that, uh, that we've been naive in assuming that, oh yeah, it all started with that explosion of those visions, whatever they were. Yeah, well, you know, Burton Mack was obviously a very brilliant scholar. Still may be. I don't know if he's still active or, not, or alive even. I don't know either, yeah. So, um, his tomb was found empty. That's his tomb was empty, yeah, right, yeah. He, uh, he actually wasn't that good. He was good. He wasn't that good. So, uh, so um, I, uh, I used to be open to that idea, but I don't really buy it anymore. Um, so in my book, um, How Jesus Became God, uh, I actually argue that, that it was the resurrection that really mattered. That, that, you know, if you have, I mean, suppose you do have this group of people up in Galilee who really appreciate things like the Sermon on the Mount or something, you know, and, they, and they're this like alternative group. Um, I just don't, I don't see how you get Christianity out of that. I mean, basically you've got a Jewish teacher who's saying some, you know, some interesting things. Uh, but you, without a resurrection, uh, so I think without, Christi without the resurrection, you don't have what would start Christianity. I, I think that's correct also, but my, the way I uh, imagine it is that those types of Christianity, like uh, what Max says is the Q community, because of what you've just said, they perished. Because uh, there was no, and like Jewish Christianity did later on, they just had no more market share. They yeah, were yeah. too Jewish for Gentiles and vice versa. Yeah. But that, that it's still possible that there were, and that's all, I mean, it's speculation any way you cut it. But if there's reason enough to think that Q implies a Zitzen Laban of a non uh, death and resurrection. Christology, uh, they, they could have existed, because any way you cut it, Constantine and the gang pretty much squashed all the other early Christianities. I wonder if that happened before without uh -huh. even any intervention. Yeah, it's just I don't think you would have any reason for people to be following Jesus in particular. I mean, he's not saying anything that's that completely unlike what anyone else is saying, so why? So if he got crucified, I mean, you know. Not somebody you want to follow, probably. Well, that's my uh, Clark Kent analogy. Like, w would, he, would you get Christianity out of a guy that was just a faith healer? Like, is, is Oral Roberts likely to give uh, uh, rise to a religion? I hope not. No, uh, maybe not. But, <laughs> but, but there are, as you know, I mean, there are, there are people who do give rise to religion who, who are not, uh, to the rest of us, are not particularly interesting people. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. That's all. That's it. All right. Okay. 
So we'll start another 10 minute segment uh, with Dr. Irvin asking questions, thank you. Okay, good. So, uh, whoops. So Bob, um, in your, one of, the, one of the things I like about your, uh, your books on, on all of this is that you talk about the importance of establishing probabilities. Uh, and, um, and you do that in a number of sophisticated ways. I mean, one of your books, uh, you talk about um, the, 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 the principle of analogy and things. We don't, we don't need to get in, because, but, but you, you know, the idea of probabilities. So, um, as you know, uh, as, you, as you know full well, uh, there are hundreds of references to things that Jesus said and did uh, in our sources. Uh, so, the Gospels are filled with stories about Jesus' teachings and his deeds, uh, things that relate to a man from Galilee who did these things. We don't have any stories uh, in our sources about the activities of a God, Jesus, uh, God Joshua, who lived in outer space. And so I'm just wondering why that's the more likely, the more probable of the two. Well, you do have theophanies in the Old Testament of the angel of Yahweh, and I kind of like, and I know this is all speculative, uh, you, you can't really get beyond that. Margaret Barker says she thinks that the reason Jesus, you know the old uh, joke that will have the, the Jesus be God was he praying to himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, uh, Barker says, well, you see, uh, it looks as if you have the survival of the pre-Deuteronomic Israelite polytheism, just like uh, you had uh, Farrakhan carrying on the original version of the Nation of Islam. You had the Latin mass Catholics who rejected uh, the official judgment of Vatican II. Well, these, these myths and beliefs don't die out. And she said that it, Jesus, she thinks, is supposed to be Jehovah and that the name Yahashua Yahweh saves that uh, he was understood to be a theophany of Yahweh and he was praying to his father, El Elyon, the Most High God, whom some uh, still distinguish between and that the distinction survives in uh, Philo with the, uh, the two cherubims uh, standing for the different natures of God, almost like... Uh, yeah, so my, I mean, my point isn't so much about what's in the Old Testament but, uh, or Philo, but uh, the sources that talk about Jesus don't talk about, a, I mean, we don't have, we don't have stories about somebody who's, who's up in the out, outer space Would doing, you do doing if he's things. Jehovah in a theophany? In the New Testament? Well, that's the idea she's, that, uh, that uh, I'm, yeah, I take seriously okay. that Barker All right, says. well, let me, let me pursue it in a different way. We have, um, we have, we know of thousands of people who were crucified by Romans, and uh, certainly hundreds, many hundreds of Jews in Palestine who were crucified by Romans. We don't have any accounts of Jews being crucified in outer space by demons. So why is it more probable that that's what, what Jesus was originally thought to be? Why, why is that more probable than just thinking there was a Jesus who was crucified by Romans like so many thousands of other people? Well. It's who are you talking about? Uh, this miracle working Superman who seems in many ways to be a classic Hercules. No, I'm not talking about him. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about the historical Jesus. Well, if there, there we go back to my Clark Kent thing. I don't know why even such a crucified figure would have made a splash. It's certainly not implausible that people got crucified, that's for sure. Well, I have no trouble believing that Clark Kent existed, but I don't think Superman did. That's right. Would there be issues of Superman comics if it was only Clark Kent? I just don't think the, like you say, would a, would a guy who was not thought to be raised from the dead have been an adequate cause for Christianity? I think yeah, no, but he, but and that's he, what he we're was, doing. He was thought to be raised from the dead. That's the whole point. But you're saying the idea of the crucifixion in the, the heavens is, is the problem. I'm saying that we know that Romans crucified thousands of people, mm -hmm. including hundreds of Jews, and so there's nothing at all improbable that Jesus was a Jew who was crucified. 
That's right, except that we have a lot of uh, Gnostic texts of redeemers who were somehow identified with the, uh, the man of light and they were done to death. And I do think that's pre-Christian stuff. I, I, just because there's a more chic, uh, in-style opinion of Gnosticism, we don't have I don't any, buy We it. don't have any of these Gnostic texts that predate Christianity. Well, we don't have any copies of the New Testament. I'm not talking about copies. I'm not talking about copies. I'm saying the texts themselves, uh, are the texts we have are written in the fourth century. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the that the texts were composed in the second century. So were the Gospels, in my reckoning. Well, but Paul was before that, and Paul doesn't talk about uh, doesn't talk about people out in outer space crucified. Well, he people. might, depending on how you take the, the Colossians and 1 Corinthians passages. Well, okay, but I mean, virtually everybody dates the Gospel of Mark to the year 70. I think they're wrong. I always like to say, you know, the consensus of scholars was that Jesus should be crucified. Uh, it's, uh, the consensus means nothing to me because you never know why there's a consensus. You can't take a nose count and determine, well, 20 million Mustang it's not owners as if everybody, can't be wrong. It's not as if every scholar is maintaining this is a fundamentalist Christian. I mean, you have agnostics and atheists and Jews and also, I mean, basically, I mean, there are reasons for dating Mark to around the year 70. So, okay, we're not, we, we can't get into that. So let, let me ask another question. How much time do I have? Four minutes. Okay, so uh, on to probability things, another probability thing. So um, there are, I mentioned earlier that there are events in the Gospels that historians tend to think are, contain a, a historical kernel. And one of them, for example, is the baptism, as you know. I mean, a lot of people think that uh, Jesus really was baptized by John the Baptist. And so I was rereading your book on uh, the book on uh, the Christ myth theory and, and its problems. And, uh, and you, you go through the Gospels to try to show that the events in the Gospels, in fact, uh, probably are not historical, not referring to a historical figure. And so on the baptism, your view is um, that this, the baptism of Jesus, where he is baptized and the heavens split open, the dove descends upon him, he hears a voice from heaven. Your view is that this is not based on anything that happened, that it's derived from the Zoroastrian traditions uh, about Zoroaster, Zoroaster, who is the son of a Vedic priest. Uh, he, he immerses himself in a river. Uh, and when he comes up, the archangel Vohumana appears to him and uh, uh, to bear him tidings from the one god, Ahura Mazda, uh, after which the evil one, Ahriman, tempts him to abandon this call. And so... I just, I'm finding this a little puzzling. Why is it more probable that this account is based on a Zoroastrian text that has to do with Vedic priests and Vohu Mana and Ahura Mazda and Arimi instead of being based on something that, uh, of some person being baptized by John the Baptist? We, I mean, we know that there was a John the Baptist. Josephus talks about him. We know that he was baptizing Jews. Uh, Jesus was a Jew living at the time, so there's nothing implausible about Jesus being baptized by John, but it, doesn't, it seems to be implausible to me that Mark is being influenced by Zoroastrian texts. There's nothing implausible about that. Judaism, as it existed among the Pharisees, uh, was heavily borrowed from Mark Zoroastrianism. Was not Mark was not Jewish. What Mark is not? Mark is not Jewish. Well, if he, he certainly is basing it on, on what he understands to be he Judaism. He shows no evidence of knowing anything about Zoroastrianism. Well, it, it's all over first century Judaism. He's not a Jew. Mark wasn't. I, I agree, but yeah. uh, could, was he not entitled to use the Old Testament either? Because uh, No, he, he did use the Jew. Old Testament. That's my point. He uses things like the Old Testament, but he doesn't use Zoroastrian sacred texts. Yeah, but text. that was built into Judaism at the time. In fact, uh, uh, T.W. Manson argued that Pharisee originally meant Parsi because the Sadducees said, you guys are, uh, have accepted all these beliefs from our Persian overlords. You're not real Jews. You're Parsis. One minute. Okay, I've just got one minute. Um, so when you, when you don't think that Jesus existed, I mean, then you, I'm sure you think that Jesus' mother, Mary, didn't exist. And so I'm just wondering about everyone else. I mean, did uh, Mary Magdalene exist? Did Mary of Bethany exist? Did Judas Iscariot exist? Did the Apostle Peter exist? Did James and John, the son of Zebedee, exist? Or, or are all of these people made up? 
uh, they're either made up or had different significances, which, I mean, it's no surprise we hear nothing outside of these second and third century apocryphal acts about the apostles other than Peter, who's just a Dr. Watson character. No, like that's Ananda. true, but we don't, in these sources, we don't hear anything about any first century Jews. So it doesn't mean they didn't exist, it just it means they don't talk about them. So. Well, if these characters are bit players in something that you have reason to think is fictitious, and that's the case I make with examining all these, uh, these items, then there's no particular reason to think that there was a, a, a Peter, especially okay. since he appears... Well, no, similar. Peter does it. I mean, Paul knows Peter. Time. Paul tells us. Okay, we're time. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to begin the final of the four 10-minute question period, so you'll be able to continue that thought or whatever else uh, comes to you. And when it's over, we'll start taking questions oh, I from... We're doing, I thought we were doing just two. It's... You each get two. He's had one. No, he's had two. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm happy to I'm sorry, go I'm with sorry. the audience questions. I'm sorry, I thought you were saying... Um, I hope I haven't lost my mind. But anyway, after this 10-minute section, then the audience will, will, will line up to take questions there. And while you're lining up, I'll exercise moderator privilege and ask a question or something. But we'll, we'll have the final 10-minute question period from Dr. Price now. Well, I would just like to clarify again that I don't think you, I admit you cannot prove any of this. It's just a question of what heuristic model makes the most sense uh, to you of the various data. And it's, of course, self-evident that uh, different people look at it differently. So I'm simply arguing, as I always say in the books, this is what seems to me the most likely view, but the, it's all speculation. In the beginning of one of my books, I say if, uh, if somebody complains that this is speculation, let me congratulate him on his grasp of the obvious. We, we cannot know this stuff, and, and a historian is always, like uh, Collingwood said, assembling a kind of a gestalt to impose on the evidence to see if it fits the, the vision of the past he has sort of conjured from looking at the evidence. It's the hermeneutical circle kind of thing that Bultmann and Heidegger talk about, but it's exactly what Bultmann says about the New Testament. You approach it with questions and you find uh, that the data does or does not address them, and so you revise your questions if they don't. That's why, like, among people that do believe there was a historical Jesus, that's about where it stops. Who or what was he? Was he a, a, a an early feminist? Was he uh, a vegetarian? Was he a socialist? Was he a community organizer? Was he a Hasidic magician? Uh, was he a liberal Pharisee? Uh, did he teach that he was the son of Dame Wisdom? I mean, there are reputable scholars who have all of these ways. Or was he a revolutionist? I think it's a particularly good case to be made for that. If I think if there was a historical Jesus, that's him, in my opinion. The the uh, SGF brand and Jesus and the Zealots thing. But uh, there's no uh, agreement. And why is that? Well, because everybody is coming up with what seems to them a, a likely paradigm, and and it's not like there's some sort of orthodoxy to be imposed. Uh, I don't think it's desirable that everybody come to agreement about this. And in fact, I always say, well, actually about atheism, but the same is true here, it is of no interest to me whether any individual converts to mythicism as if, you know, I'm accepting the no Jesus as my personal savior. I, I do not, I could not care less if uh, you believe in God or not unless you're a jihadi or something. It's just none of my business, why should I care? But I happen to be interested in this topic for no doubt for biographical reasons. I was a, I was a teen age fundamentalist. Uh, and so naturally, I've never been able to shake the question. Uh, and uh, But historians don't dogmatize if they know what they're doing. Uh, it's just a question of exploring uh, alternative possible paradigms. I make the case, I try to explain what uh, I think. In fact, I'm uh, working on a book now called Bart Ehrman Interpreted, and I ran this by Bart before I started it and explained the rationale in it, because I, I know a lot of people read both of our books and so forth, and so I figured it would be, it might do the, such readers a service to explain what I think Bart is saying and where and why and how I disagree. I'm not trying to refute him, but I'm trying to clarify things. And I think often these debates can get no farther than that because you cannot prove it. And one last thing, 
Suppose tomorrow someone were to dig up a papyrus scrap of a letter in Egypt where some uh, traveling businessman wrote home to his wife, and we do have such letters, and said, oh, I happen to uh, hear the, uh, the wise man Jesus, and he's uh, an impressive man. Suppose we found that, and there was no question about the age of it, that would be enough to drive the stake through the heart of mythicism right there. And it may happen. You know, this is not a dogma. And so I've just been trying to like contrast uh, our views. I don't think Bart's view is not viable. I hope nobody takes me to be saying that. Uh, it's just an exchange of, of different uh, opinions and reasons we hold them. Do you, do you, is, do you have any other questions? Sir? All right. All right. Well, okay. Let, 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 let. He, he's actually ceding you a moment of his remaining time, if you had a point. I, no, I, I, I just want to agree that, um, that you really, you have to figure out, I agree with the thing about a gestalt, that you've got, you've got to figure out a paradigm and plug, plug your data into the paradigm and see which paradigm makes the best sense. And I'd just like to say that for me, uh, as a historian of the ancient world, the, the best paradigm for understanding somebody like the Jesus talked about in our early Christian sources, the best paradigms are not provided uh, through Zoroastrianism or through Gnosticism. Because I don't think that Zoroastrianism was widely known. The, the gospel writers show no evidence of knowing Gnosticism, uh, of uh, Zoroastrianism. And, and Gnosticism, we simply don't have the early materials that we would need for that to be the paradigm. Because they, we don't have evidence that it even existed yet. The Gnostic writers themselves are being influenced by the Christian tradition. And so the idea that they provide the paradigm for Paul doesn't make sense because Paul was writing in the 50s and we don't have evidence of these people until the second century. So all that's right. all. Are we good? All right, so thank you. We have time remaining for audience questions. If you'd like to go ahead and line up, please, if you, if you have a question for both of them, that's fine. Um, if you have a question for one or the other, uh, let's not try to dogpile entirely on one of the two. And while people are lining up, I'd like to ask a similar question to each of you. Um, it's, there's no denying that the mythicist position isn't considered serious scholarship generally by serious scholars. And so my question for Dr. Price is, why do you think that's the case? And for Dr. Ehrman, what would it take to make you think this is deserving of serious scholarship? Uh, Michel Foucault spoke about the archive or archive of uh, accepted knowledge and assumptions in every generation, whereby certain things can be considered, others can't, and like we say ad nauseum these days, it's a matter of can you think outside the box. Uh, and I think that uh, when the, the mainstream, say, of the Society of Biblical Literature implicitly becomes a kind of magisterium. If you want to play the professional game, uh, you, you're going, to, you're welcome to do it only within certain parameters. I, I don't think I would be allowed if I tried to, uh, to uh, make a statement of this. I just, even at the Jesus Seminar, I gave a similar presentation on the Pauline Epistles, and even these supposed radicals said, well now, let's get back to sanity. Oh, thanks. Uh, there's, uh, it's just like certain things are unthinkable, I think, and, uh, and they're, they're, I'm, I don't care how many people think this or that, I want to hear the arguments, but I think that's kind of the way it is. You, you have to play the game that people are playing, and I don't blame them, because the kind of interaction they want to have is there's certain rules to a game. Uh, and uh, like, uh, for instance, the Paul thing, here it's difficult for me to get into that because I go along with the Dutch radicals of the 19th century that Paul wrote none of the epistles attributed to him. Well, that puts such a gulf between us, and I think the Gospels are written in the second century, it's hard to bridge that gap or to find common ground. So it's certainly understandable why people say, let's draw these rules up for the game or we can't play it. I understand that and I'm, I'm not playing by those rules. Doesn't make me right or wrong. And 
and Dr. Armin, on that question, what do you think it would take to make this uh, viable in serious scholarship? Right. So, uh, I mean, you're right. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a question that's debated among scholars. Uh, most scholars simply uh, don't even think it's it's worth debating because of the the overwhelming evidence. And so, um, I think I'll tell you what I think needs to happen. If I mean, if, if people really want to keep pursuing the mythicist issue, the, I mean, I, I personally think it's a mistake to pursue, pursue the issue. I think that there might be better avenues to take for people interested in these things. But if you desperately want to pursue the mythicist issue, the only re way it's ever going to be taken seriously in the academy is by people establishing their credentials in the academy and showing that they have... Um, that, that they are published, that they, they publish books on topics, not on mythicism, but just publish books on topics with Oxford University Press or Harvard University Press or Yale University Press and get positions in universities uh, as professors in some cognate field, uh, ancient history, uh, classics, early Judaism, early Christianity, uh, and on the basis of having some authority, argue the position. Uh, because at present, it's just look, looked at as a, as a view that, that outliers have who are just trying, who just think religion is nonsense, and so they're coming up with these, these arguments to show that religion is nonsense. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the view people have, but that is how it's perceived. And, uh, you know, and people think that the argument itself is just nonsense. I mean, people just think it's, it's a laughable argument. And so for it not to be a laughable argument, I think it has to be advanced by people who are recognized by the academic world as serious academicians. Okay, thanks. Uh, first question. Uh, I'm Frank Sindler from American Atheist Press. You know, it's both amusing and sobering to realize that if the docetists had won the wars of the second and third centuries, we wouldn't be having this debate tonight, would we? <laughs> we'd, we'd be debating something much more significant, like was there a historical tooth fairy? Um, my question, <laughs> actually I have two, but, but Matt told me that uh, I can only ask one and then you I've got to recycle, then, go to the back then of I've got to go to the back of the line, so I shall <laughs> try to do that. But my first question, uh, Bart, um, in your Did Jesus Exist, you uh, criticized books written by Bob and by me and various other scholars. And uh, in response to your um, uh, criticisms, we composed uh, this 600-page Bart Ehrman and the Quest of the Historical Jesus, which we are selling at the back table. In this, we replied to all of your uh, points in your book, as well as all of the points you've made tonight uh, in great detail. Um, and as you know, I re re reprinted our email correspondence that we conducted for about two and a half years uh, and presented evidence that you said was not uh, in existence. Um, I have had the impression that you have never read this book to see what we had to say. And I was listening very carefully tonight in, in your comments, for example, on Nazareth and things like that, uh, to see whether there was any clue that you had, in fact, read this book. And I couldn't hear any evidence that you had ever read this book. And so I guess I'm, uh, my question is this, then. Uh, have you ever read this book? Or if not, why not? Okay, thank you. Uh, so first, let me say, first of all, if the docetists had won, the docetists actually did not deny that there was a historical Jesus. So we still could be having this argument. Uh, the docetists thought that there was a person Jesus. They simply thought that he wasn't a flesh and blood human being, but they didn't deny that he did the things that are said about him in the Gospels. Uh, Frank, I've read the book. I've read it twice. I haven't responded to it because I disagree with everything in it. And um, if I responded to the book, it, I would have to write an 800-page book. And then you would write a 1,600-page book. And then I'd have to write a 3,200-page book. And frankly, I'm just doing other things with my life. All right, next question. Hi, my name's Tom Leeds. Uh, this is for mostly for you, Bart. Um, the vast majority of scholars just accept Jesus being real. 
Mephisticism has been kind Can of Can you step up to the mic? I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing Sorry. you, and I don't know if anybody... The vast can. majority of scholars have accepted that Jesus is real. Mephisticism has been pretty much ignored, uh, at least for a critical uh, evaluation of, of books and other research. Do you think mythicism has value uh, as to the conversation, or do you think it is a distraction of whether or not, uh, well, adds value to the conversation of whether or not Jesus was real, or is it a distraction of whether or not Jesus was God or not? And if Jesus wasn't real, do you think that really matters? Uh, okay, I mean, I, I'll be completely honest. Uh, I don't think it's a valuable conversation. I don't think that it's contributing anything. Um, I think, and it may be that I'm just reading my own agenda into what's going on with the mythicist movement, but my sense is, and I know Bob disagrees with this, so he, he may want to say something about this because he, he does talk about this in his book. Um, he disagrees with my sense, which is, my sense is that mythicism is a way of showing uh, the, the, the very deeply rooted problems in Christianity, uh, that if your Jesus didn't exist, then you really have no basis for your faith. Uh, I myself am an agnostic. I identify as both as an agnostic and as, a, and as an atheist. I completely identify with the humanist agenda. Um, uh, I, I don't hate Christians, and I don't think they're foolish, uh, but, and I don't think that what they're doing is nonsense. I don't, I don't think that. But I do think that if you want to promote a humanist agenda, um, the best way to do that and the best way to promote conversation is not to advance a position that most people in the world either have never heard of or when they do hear of it, they just think it's silly. Uh, and so um, I think that there are better ways to promote what I take to be the agenda lying beneath it all. But again, I know Bob doesn't think that's the agenda. So. Well, actually, I just draw a distinction. I do get the impression that very many people excited about mythicism are using it as a kind of part of a scorched earth approach to um, blow Christianity out of the water and so on. And I, I think that is um, a mistake. Uh, you, you have to bracket any such motives and just consider uh, the case in its own right. Like, I, I think I know what's motivating fundamentalist apologists like William Layden Craig, but it really doesn't matter. I need to address what he is saying. And uh, so I, I suspect an awful lot of mythicists are motivated, but I'm not that way, but I'm not a mind reader. And I always like to point out that uh, it, it, there could be a God, but no historical Jesus. There could have been a historical Jesus, and yet there is no God. Uh, and uh, that um, the, these questions have to be kept separate. And uh, it, if depending on how one defines the humanist agenda, I'm not so sure I'm promoting it. So. Next. Hey, great debate. Uh, this question is mostly for uh, Dr. Ehrman. Uh, do you utilize the Bayesian principles for sorry, the, that, okay, okay. Uh, the, the Bayesian principles? Oh, the you Bayesian the thing, theorem yeah, yeah, no. what that about, Dr. Carrier yes. uh, utilizes in his books? Uh, do, you, do you utilize that principle, Dr. Ehrman? Uh, no, I don't know any historian except for... I know two historians who employ the, the uh, Bayesian principle. Um, so uh, most historians simply don't think you can do history that way. Uh, the two historians that I, the two people I know who employ it uh, are Richard Carrier right. uh, and uh, Richard Swinburne. Richard Swinburne uses uh, the Bayesian theorem, theorem in order to demonstrate that there is an extremely high level of probability that Jesus was physically raised from the dead. Now, Swinburne is a, uh, he's a bona fide scholar. He's a philosopher at Oxford University. I think that argument is flat out crazy. Uh, but it is interesting to me that the two people who employ the Bayesian theorem, one of them uses it to prove that Jesus was physically raised from the dead at a very high level of probability, and the other uses it to prove at a very high level of probability that Jesus never existed. <laughs> so... I don't know. I'm not a statistician myself. I've had, statis I've had statisticians who tell me that, that both people are misemploying it, but I, I have no way of evaluating it. I don't have the... Uh, so, I, so I don't use it myself, and, uh, but uh, I do think that's an interesting irony. Can I... Thank you very much. Great to be. 
I uh, just want to comment. I, I don't have a comment on Bayesian probability because I'm too stupid to understand what it is. <laughs> You and I read Richard's book at the same time. Uh, next question, please. Good evening. It's a question for both speakers. In Jesus Before the Gospels, Bart talks about how people in the ancient world and even today misremember Jesus. For example, Pontius Pilate gets more innocent throughout the Gospels or the prosperity gospel of today versus Jesus' teachings and statements concerning giving away everything you own. Bart has, has said, the historical Jesus did not make history, the remembered Jesus did. And in his lecture, Subjective Conscious and the Historical Jesus, Bob talks about how some of the stories, parables, teachings, and sayings of Jesus are later more modern myths. For example, the story of the woman taken in adultery or the jock Jesus of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So Bart says, misremembering the historical Jesus mythologizes him, and Bob says, creating your own personal Jesus consumes the historical Jesus. And my question for both of you is, how exactly are those two things different? At the end of the day, isn't the Jesus of the Gospels, Jesus of Nazareth, a fictional character? Thank you. Would you like to go first? I do think it's it's the case, and there's a great irony pointed out by the great 19th century liberal Protestant theologian Albrecht Ritchel, who was much more optimistic about defining a historical Jesus uh, than, than I am. He was sort of in the Harnack camp, though actually Harnack based his view on Ritchel, but he said that, that uh, He's about the only person I know of in scholarship that actually attacked this idea of uh, Jesus as your personal savior. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm going to hell and all this kind of thing. Um, he said, look what you're doing. You're subsuming the only Jesus we know we've got, the one we can reconstruct historically, uh, to a, an imaginary friend, an imaginary playmate. He didn't put it that way, but that's what it amounts to. That, so which is the important thing, your, the Christ of your faith, or the only possible yardstick for measuring it, the historical Jesus? Well, I, I don't think we can know what the historical Jesus was, if there was one, but he was highlighting exactly this point, that the personal savior has this ironic implication, my customized savior, my Jesus, the one on the, the dashboard of my mind. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, when, you, when you phrase the question the way you did, it does sound like Bob and I are very close on the issue, and in some ways we are, because I, you know, I absolutely don't think that the that Jesus uh, walked on the water and multiplied the loaves of bread and um, and raised people from the dead. I absolutely do not think that those stories are true, but I absolutely think that there was a Jesus of Nazareth, uh, and I think we can say a lot of things about him. The fact that he didn't do all those miracles doesn't mean he didn't exist uh, any more than Caesar Augustus didn't exist because he didn't do all those things. Uh, and he wasn't really the son of God, and he wasn't really miraculously born, and he didn't really ascend to heaven. Well, of course he didn't, but, he, but there still was a Caesar Augustus. I think history really matters. I mean, I think it matters whether we, we, we correctly know what happened in the past, especially with important uh, historical figures. And I think um, whatever else we might think about Jesus, he's the most important historical figure in the history of the West. And so it matters that we know something about him. And I think we can say a good deal about him. And so that's what I was saying. I mean, many years ago now, I wrote a book on the historical Jesus where I lay out in uh, you know, several hundred pages what we can actually say about the man. And I think it's important for us to know what we can say about him. So there's about 30 minutes of questioning left. Expect more crackdown on short questions, please. Great debate, thank you. Uh, on the positive side, uh, Bart Ehrman uh, said, uh, quoted Galatians 1, 18 through 19, where Paul meets Cephas and, and James. Also, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, you are a textual critic. On the negative side, we have 
Uh, Are you scoring Dr. Price, this or did you have a question? Yeah, it's coming. Dr. Price said it was an interpolation or a textual variant. Now, I would like Ehrman to interact with that, that uh, consideration. Uh, can you interact with that, that assertion and also the Carmen Christi uh, as evidence for the historical Jesus and passing Margaret Barker uh, is Mormonism's favorite non-Mormon scholar. Okay, well, I'm not going to deal with the last one because we have a short, short amount of time. I'll just say that, you know, if you want to say that uh, Galatians 1, 19 is an interpolation, 1 Corinthians 15 is an interpolation, if you don't want to believe that Nazareth existed, you say Mark chapter 1, verse 9 is, a, is an interpolation. You just basically, you, you, when, you, when you find verses that flat out contradict what you think, then your response is, well, that wasn't originally there. Well, scholars have ways of knowing whether something was originally there or not. They don't just guess at it, and they don't just throw out things they don't like. Uh, there is no manuscript of the New Testament that omits Galatians 1, 19, or 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5. These passages are as textually secure as you can get. We have hundreds of manuscripts of these passages, and every manuscript has these passages. The passages fit in with the, uh, the, uh, the style of Paul, the theology of Paul, the views of Paul. And so throwing them out simply, it, for me, is scholarship by convenience. It's getting rid of something that doesn't agree with you because it doesn't agree with you, in, in, in my opinion. Well, it wasn't mythicists who made those suggestions. Uh, and they, they, in fact, one was an anti-mythicist, but he says, I have to admit that the, the uh, James thing in Galatians, uh, it's based on patristic evidence, which is certainly invoked in textual criticism, that Irenaeus quotes uh, the Galatians 2 thing about the, what now reads as the, the second visit to Jerusalem and the, the, the second, again, et cetera, isn't in there, there though the rest of it is a, a full quote. And that uh, Marcion is said by the church fathers not to have had that. And those are pretty early uh, attestations. Keep in mind that we have no manuscripts uh, from uh, this tunnel period. So you can't assume that they're simply couldn't have been any interpolations. Agnosticism gets transformed into fideism. If we can't prove there were, we can go ahead and assume there weren't, and I think you may just have to be satisfied with agnosticism on the point. Yeah, but Bob, I mean, you would agree. No, nobody would establish the text of Galatians or 1 Corinthians on the basis of the quotations of Irenaeus or Marcion. It just, it is not, it cannot be done. What, what do you mean by establishing the text? We, as you've pointed out, we don't really, we can't claim we know what was in it originally. Okay, well, we can, yes. Okay. Next question. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, on your blog and in How Jesus Became God, uh, you say that Paul believed, uh, quote, that Christ was a great angel who came into the world to uh, fulfill God's plan, or it was a divine being who came into the world. And in the Philippian hymn, you quote, uh, you talk about Paul quoting an, quote, ancient creed. So if Paul believed that Jesus was an angel or great angel or divine being, and that the creed that he talks about, in, uh, that he's quoting the Philippian hymn is ancient, is that not putting the existence of Jesus far before the uh, uh, word, um, uh, yeah. uh, gospel documents are yeah. placing him and then Dr. Price you quoted really quickly your belief in uh, the chaos dragon and the, the metaphors what time frame would you put these early uh, beliefs about Christ see now you're cheating the, and you got two see, questions I'm, I'm putting a time frame yeah, okay. in, so look, I'm just phrasing it differently look, look, we can, so sorry about your Bob and, I are really agree, that. Bob and I are going to agree on the time frame that these are early these are very early traditions that you would agree they're Paul, pretty Pauline right the Philippians hymn couldn't put a date to it because I, whoops, sorry, uh, I uh, think that um, 
these things are in the works. Notice that uh, Jesus comes up only at the very end of it. That is the name that is given to the hitherto unnamed Savior after he's ascended and, uh, and so forth. As Paul Cushot, a mythicist, pointed out, that alone, he thought, was enough to destroy the story of the Gospels with a guy named Jesus. Yeah, except like for that it name. occurs in verse 5. I'm sorry? It occurs in verse 5. Jesus Christ. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's not part of the who, supposed text. Is it the creed? The hymn? No, the whole point is when, when, when the creed is about Jesus Christ. It, the creed begins with the relative pronoun who. Yeah, like uh, the one in uh, the pastorals yeah. and so, Colossians. So it's, it's, it's clearly talking about Jesus Christ. Well, it is in its present context, but if it is an earlier text, that's not quite clear. Like the Q material, uh, it's, it's very likely, it seems to me, that Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said has been added by a Christian editor because the sound's uh, pretty, I know yeah, you don't buy so. the yeah, Q1 yeah, yeah. thing. but Okay, uh, well, we, could, we need to talk about this one over a beer. So, uh, yeah. so uh, did, right, okay, yeah, but, but yeah, Jesus is an you, angel you have a, the no, first part, have, I guess, is Yeah, no, I'll, let me answer question. your question yes, quickly please, because we have a lot of people yeah. behind you. Yep. So, you, you make a really good point that I, I absolutely think that Paul thought that Jesus was a pre-existent divine being. Uh, he was an angel before he became a human being. But Paul thinks he became a human being, and there really was a man Jesus. He, he says that he was born of a woman. He says that he was born as a Jew. He says that he ministered to Jews. He says that he had 12 disciples. He said he has brothers. He, the, so there was a man, Jesus. It's just that he wasn't like the rest of us. He was an angel who became a human being, but he was a human being for Paul. Next question. Okay, thank you. Ooh, the floor is slippery in here. Yeah, the, there's a wire taped down on the floor there. Be careful as you walk up to the mic. Uh, okay, a uh, question for Robert Price. You keep asking that uh, somebody as mundane as Clark Kent would not inspire a gospel, but perhaps the metaphor isn't Clark Kent. Perhaps the metaphor is someone like a modern rock star. I mean, look at all the many people who believe they've seen Elvis alive uh, after his death in 77. Uh, I remember seeing a documentary uh, 20 years ago that said that the rock group, the Moody Blues, decided to stop touring when someone came backstage and asked them to bless their album. Uh, although I did see on the marquee out here the window that they are coming to Milwaukee in a week. Uh, uh, and so, maybe they'll have a question. Okay, so I mean, why, why not just assume that the myth accumulates around someone that's relatively charismatic and uh, magnetic and that he's not a non-entity as, as Clark Kent is portrayed in at least the Christopher Reeve movies. I mean. Well, if Jesus is an itinerant teacher or even an exorcist, as uh, Josephus and Lucian of Samosata say, these people were a dime a dozen. It would, it would be like uh, almost like saying Kenneth Copeland was the son of God. Uh, he has an avid group of fans that thinks he's teaching wisdom and, and he's even supposedly healing people, but I, I don't know that that is an adequate foundation for uh, Jesus Christ. It's like uh, Paul says in the movie version of uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, he meets Jesus on the road because Jesus didn't die on the cross, though Paul thinks he did, and he says, I'm glad I met you so I can forget you. People don't need you. They need my Jesus who died and rose from the dead, who was born of a virgin, and so on. And that's kind of what I'm saying. I, I think that this is like saying uh, that uh, Hercules was just a weightlifter, though he was the Schwarzenegger of the ancient world. Is that really going to give rise to the Hercules mythology? It just seems to me, uh, was there an Asclepius? I mean, there are loads of healing stories uh, about Asclepius, but there's no chance he existed. Or Krishna, did Krishna exist? Uh, Moses, uh, highly unlikely there was ever a Moses. Yes, but the, the whole point is you don't have the kind of evidence for any of those figures that you have for Jesus. You don't have Gospels written about Hercules. Uh, or, yes, you do. <laughs> no, Hercules. You, you, do not, you do not have four Gospels writ written within 40 years based on oral traditions. Within 40 years of what? That that's begs the of question. Of his reputed life. But suppose, I mean, that's... that's 
begging the question that we know mythicism is it true that it didn't just gradually evolve from other similar myths. Well, which you I yourself would agree that if Jesus lived, he, he was known, if Jesus didn't live, that the Christ myth is referred to by Paul in the 50s. Right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Would you agree that Paul converted b- about 20 years before he wrote his letters? I hate to tell you, but I think the whole conversion thing is based on Heliodorus's conversion in the Bacchae. Uh, I mean, in Second Maccabees and Pentheus's conversion in the Bacchae. I think it's all fiction. You don't think Paul became a Christian? Uh, I think that uh, there are hints in Romans 16, for instance, that he was uh, from a family of people like Andronicus and Junius, his kinsmen who were in Christ before him, that he probably, like Constantine, there's a myth about his conversion, but both may very likely have grown up Christians. Oh, well, if Paul grew up a Christian... uh, Could be. When... when, Really? Because the stories of his conversion uh, are... (laughs) Well, I guess Paul, him, just Paul himself there's... says. Paul himself says that he became. If he actually wrote that, that's why I say there's no common ground. If he, if he wrote, you, you think he didn't write Galatians? That's right. I think that. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, uh, since my views are just that's be laughably the insane, there's no point in going on. Well, but we're, we're, come on, Bob. Paul didn't write Galatians. Okay. All right. Yes. Um. I come at this from the standpoint that what's really being asked here is what are the origins of Christianity? How does it relate to ancient Judaism and and how did the two become or how did the one become two, I guess? Um, and given the fact that you have all of these clues within acknowledged Jewish documents, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Apocrypha, the Wisdom of Solomon, Philo's writings, um, and Jewish angelology that was all going on at this time. What is there that is implausible about that as an origin for the Christian religion, for the Christian beliefs? You lost me. What was the origin? That it was basically a, a, a natural metamorphosis from elements of Jewish thought that were already there. You have, you have the Jews telling the story that there was a Jesus, but he lived 150 years before the turn of the uh, millennium. You have many stories. You have all of the references that, uh, to Philo's Logos, to uh, the Wisdom of Solomon that, that contain very similar concepts to the Son of Man, the teacher of light, all of these things. Why do you not consider that to be as plausible an explanation for the origin of Christianity? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't because the earliest attestation of what Christianity was was that it was the worship of a crucified Messiah, and you don't get that in Jewish circles. So uh, it it couldn't be just a kind of a natural evolution out of something that existed. Uh, The other thing is that a lot of those sources you're talking about, about Jesus living 150 years earlier or something, those are those are way after way after Paul. So you can't use sources from the second, third, fourth century to show what people were saying in the 20s. Any more than you could use something that's being said today say, in, uh, in political discourse today. You can't use what's going on in political discourse today to show what was happening in the 1750s. Okay, I'm not going to comment. Yeah. I ask some questions. Next Thank question, you. please. Okay, uh, I have one question for, uh, what is it, uh, both speakers. I'm wondering if you've seen or have heard or read about a documentary by James Cameron called The Lost Tomb of Jesus. And this is where uh, they claim to have found Jesus' family tomb, and the tomb contained like 12 ossuaries, and five or six of them had names on it, and Jesus was one name on one of the ossuaries. So was his brother James, so was uh, uh, Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene was there, and I think uh, there was one other name on Matthew, which Joseph. might... Joseph. Yeah, right. 
And I'm wondering if you have uh, viewed this documentary and, wh and what both of your comments are on it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, I can give my opinion. I mean, uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think at all it was Jesus' tomb. Um, I think that uh, there's no way that Jesus' family would have had a family tomb in Jerusalem. Uh, tombs like this only belong to extremely wealthy people, uh, upper class elite people. And Jesus, uh, Jesus came from very poor roots, and his family didn't live in Jerusalem. They wouldn't have had a tomb in Jerusalem. His family was from Galilee. Uh, and so I think that there, there is almost no chance that this could be the tomb of Jesus. Yeah, I don't buy that either. And the thing that really kills it for me is that the argument is fundamentally based on the idea that you have a particular constellation of names that appear in the Gospels and uh, that what are the chances of that if it's not the same family constellation? But the fact that there are other names in there just destroys that. Uh, you, you can't, I mean, if you could show it's the same names and only those names, but you're, you're like, I think these, I think that, uh, uh, what the heck's the, uh, Jay, mm. Yeah, jeez, what's the matter with me, right? Uh, if you're going to start out by saying, you see, it's this particular group, and then you say, well, of course, there were several others. It's not the same uh, particular group, so that's it as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Hello. Thank, you. thank you all three of you for being here tonight. I hope you're enjoying Milwaukee. <laughs> all right. My question is, uh, I've, I've heard... I have a few people spotting this uh, uh, I'm to collect my thoughts here right. about a, a theory that about, like Jesus has uh, been a, like a surname for a few Jews who had radical ideas and since uh, in Roman times they were per they were pa basically a, a suppressed group uh, w maybe they used uh, Jesus as a name to as a cover uh, I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts on that? Well, it is true that uh, there are people like Theudas the magician and uh, the unnamed Egyptian who seemed to be trying to repeat deeds attributed to Joshua. And uh, it makes you wonder, though you, you can't do more than that, if they were trying to set themselves up as a kind of a new Joshua or Yehoshua or Jesus. Uh, and uh, so that role model, that might have existed, but of course it was a common name too. And Josephus mentions loads of them, Jesus, son of Sapphias, who was a, a, a bandit, and uh, Jesus, Ben Ananias, who was uh, flogged by the Roman procurator after he was uh, pronouncing doom on Jerusalem and all that. It, it's so common a name, it's difficult to say, but there, there is something to that in that you could read these stories as people posing as a new Joshua. Could I? Yeah, that's, that's, Next question. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you. Uh, I've just got a couple of verses here I just want your comments about. In the book of Hebrews, um, in chapter 4 of Hebrews, uh, Paul talks about the gospel that was preached to the uh, people of the children of Moses. He says, the gospel is preached unto them as well as unto us. Also in 1 Corinthians, he talks about that they drink, speaking of Moses, from the same spiritual drink, for they drink of that spiritual rock, and that rock that followed them was Christ. And the third comment is from Galatians 4, that uh, Paul talks about, he says that the scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. You also have in the book of Revelation that he was crucified before the foundations of the world. So my question to you is, what is that gospel and who is that Christ? Well, uh, about uh, the, the gospel and Abraham in the context, the argument is that God will save you by the faith of Abraham who had never heard of the Torah since it hadn't been given yet. And he said in the same way, though of course you have to factor in Christ, uh, the, the salvation is still by faith. So I think that's what he means by gospel there. Um, the, the stuff in Hebrews 
and also in Romans and First Corinthians that this stuff was written down for our benefit. I used to think that was an implausible double meaning thing. Ah, they were really talking about Christians, but no, I mean, it's obvious that, uh, of course, the people that wrote down these Old Testament stories were writing them down as lessons for posterity, so I don't see anything odd about that. Uh, the one about G Jesus uh, being slain before the foundation of the world, something like that, and in, in somewhere in Revelation also, that does make me wonder if that's the, uh, the, the celestial death of Jesus, like uh, Purusha or the Gnostic uh, Redeemers, but of course it's just a quick reference with no explanation. We're in oh. agreement. Uh, my name is Bryce. Um, thank you all for doing this. It's amazing. Oh, wonderful debate. Um, so I may divert from the consensus on the panel. I don't think that Clark Kent or Superman were real people. Uh, I think that Siegel, uh, Siegel and Schuster DC Comics were real people, and they created them. So um, I, I'm, I'm a Mormon history nerd. I love Mormon history, and I believe that Joseph Smith was a real person, but I don't think that the angel Moroni or in the angel Nephi, as some manuscripts have it, were real people. Um, people broke off with Mormon uh, Joseph Smith that continued believing in the angel Moroni. You have the Brewsterites, Parashites, the Strangites, the Brighamites, and moved out to Utah. Uh, you even have Christopher Namelka today, who's published uh, writings of the angel Moroni. Very interesting, 180 years after the Mormon church was founded. My question is, um, Dr. Ehrman, with so many parallels between uh, Joseph Smith and Saul of Tarsus uh, being real people, um, and Moroni and Jesus possibly being myth mythical people, uh, is it a case of special pleading saying that Jesus was a real person, but Moroni was just an angel or just, you know, a imagination in Joseph Smith's mind? And then on the same side of that same question, Dr. Price, is it considered false equivocation to draw parallels between these two people, Joseph Smith and Saul of Tarsus? Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think the angel Moroni and Jesus are of the same kind. I mean, the angel Moroni was never presented as a, as a human being who was uh, about whom four gospels were written or about whom people, he was pre presented as an angel who came from heaven. Uh, Jesus was a human being for Paul uh, and for the gospel writers. And so, so it is, I don't think it's the same thing. It's not, not an apt comparison, I think. Well, uh, Mormon and Moroni were supposed to be ancient uh, American Israelites and that they were uh, transfigured and taken up. Um, but of course, they're supposed to be uh, remote from the time of Joseph Smith, but he thought they were actually historical figures, we, we don't. Uh, the thing with uh, what makes Jesus different from Caesar Augustus, for instance, is precisely that you can't explain Roman history uh, Western history without Caesar Augustus uh, because he's just too closely woven in but Jesus it seems to me it's like Moses all the stories seem to be intended as, as lessons and all that which seems to me there's no real reason to think they weren't fabricated as such and the few places Jesus appears to be tied into history with King Herod and uh, Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate again non-mythicists have raised fatal objections to these stories being historical. You don't have to, you know, be special pleading to say that uh, that those things, the pilot would never have lifted a finger to, to save Jesus. The Herod stories borrowed from Josephus' Moses nativity, the, the Sanhedrin trial on Passover Eve it, it, it was written by somebody that doesn't know uh, what the circumstances were at the time. So if you take that away, I think Jesus is free floating. You can insert him in history and where you want and people did in different places. That's the difference between him and Augustus or Cyrus of Persia or so on. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, sorry. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank both of you for doing this. Uh, unlike Dr. Ehrman, I do believe this is very important as a skeptic. I think the search for truth is a very fucking important thing for all of us. Sorry. Sorry for the language. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, my, my question is for Dr. Ehrman. Um, boiling it down to, to its... Uh, you know, base point, your, your argument is based entirely on the fact that we should accept hearsay as a factual reference for believing in Jesus. And 
I want to know at what point does hearsay become something that you can create a shareable position on that, that you're completely sure on um, it, it, when you have so much other hearsay that, you know, uh, we, we could say that Noah existed or Abraham existed based on hearsay. I mean, we have all this hearsay and there, there's no sure evidence of any of it. So at what so, point so you're do you have a level of surety? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy yeah. to answer. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, what I would suggest is if you really want to pursue the question is you look at how historians do their work. How do historians establish what probably happened in the past? Um, unless somebody from the past left you writings, then the only way you know about them is if somebody else told about them. And so if you have a figure from the past uh, that you have, say, one source for that is 400 years later who says incredible things and like that's all you have, then that's a different situation from if you've got a figure about whom people uh, independently of one another talk about this person and say similar things about this person uh, and that you can date some of these sources actually within years of when this person lived, that's better evidence. So historians always are trying to establish probabilities of what happened. And we can't have the kind of scientific certainty that you can have, uh, for example, you can have in a chemistry laboratory where you can redo the experiment time and time again. But when you're dealing with the past, you're always dealing with oral traditions. And so I think what you, what historian, what I can tell you what historians do is they, they carefully examine every surviving source to see whether in fact it's just gossip and rumor or if in fact it's based on solid historical uh, probability. And so that's, that's what we have to do and that's what we do with Jesus. Thank you, sir. Did you want to address the probability? This is going to be the last question. Yes. All right, so one of the ladies could come up and be the last question after this guy. You guys can fight it out in the back while we're <laughs> taking this question. This, this question is mostly addressed to Dr. Ehrman, but... By the way, there, there is an after party afterwards, and you may be able to ask questions then. Um, Dr. Price is certainly... I'd like to hear your view as well. Uh, Dr. Ehrman... Can you move up the mic a little bit? Dr. Ehrman, in your opening statement, you seem to make a big deal about the crucifixion and as you were talking about can't that you. I'm, can't it, it, as, can't as you're in your opening statement you were talking about the crucifixion a lot and, and and as I was you were talking I was thinking about Joseph Smith who damn well better have lost those golden tablets before someone figured out they were just painted lead or something similarly because dead men tell no tales the whether by design or some organic evolution of the Jesus story they had to get rid of him before they figured out he was just a regular guy or he died of dysentery or something or you know drowned in the sea they of Galilee. They had to get rid of what? Jesus. They had to kill him and what better way to get rid of him than have him murdered by the dreaded Romans. So I, I didn't find that argument. I mean, there, some yeah, of the other things you said were very convincing but but the argument that the Messiah couldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have chosen him to be crucified just wasn't convincing to me. So how else would they have handled that problem with Jesus who, you know, yes. was not a miracle worker and yes. just regular Thank guy? Yes, thank you. The, the issue, I, I don't think I can be conveyed my point very well, which is uh, typically what happens with me. So what I was, if they wanted to get rid of Jesus and they wanted to come up with an excuse to kill him, they would have said Jesus was crucified. That, that's what you're saying. Right. What I'm saying is they wouldn't have said they crucified Christ. The, the idea of a Christ was a Jew, there was a Jewish figure, or there, there were numerous different Jewish figures they considered to be the Christ. The Christ was a title for the anointed one from God who was going to overthrow the enemy and set up a kingdom on earth. If they wanted to talk about getting rid of Jesus, they would have simply said they killed Jesus, they crucified Jesus. But they said they crucified Christ, and I'm saying they wouldn't have made that up because the Christ was not supposed to be crucified. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I still don't buy it, but... Well, I'm not asking you to buy it, but if you do want to buy it, it's uh, for sale in the lobby. <laughs> All 
All right, final question. Um, Dr. Ehrman, you mentioned a lot that uh, Paul said this and Paul said that, and that's really your, your kind of your basis for why we should trust that um, the historicity of Christ. I'm wondering if you can expand with a bit more detail on how we can know uh, from a historical standpoint that a Paul, you know, this might take another debate, but that Paul did actually exist and that what he wrote was actually a real person writing about real people and real events. How do we really know that it wasn't just somebody writing a story? Okay, thank you. Yeah, how do we know that Paul lived and how do we know he wrote uh, the things that we think he wrote? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, the, it kind of goes down to the answer I was giving earlier. So, like, how do historians go about doing what they're doing? How do you know that anybody lived? I mean, how do you know that Plutarch lived? Or how do you know Suetonius lived? Or how do you know Tacitus lived? Or how do you know Julius Caesar lived? Or how do you, how do you know somebody lived? And you, you, you look to see if you have, I mean, you look for evidence. And so with the Apostle Paul, um, how do we know he lived? Well, we do have references to Paul from the first century in, uh, in several sources. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, he was a, uh, he's the main figure in the book of Acts, which tells a lot about his life. Uh, he's mentioned in the book of First Clement. Uh, First Clement was almost certainly written around in the mid-90s of the Common Era. They're, they're very, I mean, you know, I could, I could talk for 20 minutes about how we know First Clement was written in the 90s, but it, it almost certainly was. And it mentions Paul having been killed in an earlier generation. Uh, and so, so we have external references to Paul. We also have uh, books that claim to be written by Paul that we think Paul did not write. Well, that meant that the authors of those books thought that Paul existed, uh, and they thought they knew something about him. So we have, in the New Testament, we have um, three, we, we have six letters that probably Paul did not write that claim to be written by him. Three of those each has a different, a different author. We know on the basis of linguistic analysis that these three authors were all different from one another. The other three letters were probably all written by the same author. So those are four authors who did not corroborate with one another who all thought that Paul existed, along with First Clement and the book of Acts. Um, in addition, we have seven other letters that cohere with one another uh, linguistically and in terms of their theology and in terms of their presupposed historical situation so that people think they were written by the same author. This author, in each case, claims to be Paul. And so... Um, when historians look at that, there seems to be zero reason to think that Paul did not exist. So uh, I, I don't think that any, I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know why anybody would say Paul didn't exist when you have this kind of evidence. That kind of evidence for the existence of Paul is, it's not as good as Caesar Augustus, uh, the, uh, you know, Caesar Augustus, there, you know, you'd have to be you just have to, I mean, to deny that Caesar Augustus existed would be like, you know, denying that Bill Clinton existed. I mean, it's like he did exist. I mean, so, uh, so Paul's not at that level, but, but there is substantial evidence. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's possible that it's all a hoax. I mean, it's possible that somebody in the 12th century, like, made all this up and, and, and forged manuscripts and made them look like they were 800 years old. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible, but what, you know, the question would be, what would make you think so? And so uh, for historians to deny the, that kind of evidence, they have to have some compelling reason other than the fact that they'd prefer it was some other way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to me, it's not a question of whether Paul existed, but who was he? Uh, may, maybe he, was he known by other names and so on? Uh, the question is, do we know who wrote these epistles? And starting right off, uh, like there's a truckload of stuff attributed to Peter that no scholar thinks he wrote, including first and second Peter, also third and fourth Peter that didn't make it into the canon, and uh, the, uh, the apocalypse of Peter, the gospel of Peter, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody thinks Peter wrote that. Uh, with the, the stuff attributed to Paul, already over half of it is discredited by uh, critical scholars. And to my satisfaction, uh, W.C. von Manen and others used the same sort of criteria to show that the same person, whoever it was, did not write uh, any of them. It's, they're filled with anachronisms and contradictions implying that what we have here are patchwork quilts written by different Paulinists, as if you had uh, Lutherans of different stripes 
uh, writing phony letters by Martin Luther. I mean, I don't think anybody did with Luther, but they sure did with the ancient cynic philosophers and so on. I think it is not at, uh, in the least implausible that uh, with the Pauline writings, it's just like the Petrine writings, there's no reason to accept any of them. And uh, let me refer you to my book, um, the Amazing Colossal Apostle, The Search for the Historical Paul, and the introductions to the Pauline epistles in my pre-Nicene New Testament. Crazy though it may be, there you'll find some of the uh, arguments set out. Thank you so much. Can we have uh, one more large round of applause? There's gonna be a few of them.